And that uh, confirmation of the agenda. Mr. Reeve Campbell and Councillor Sike. All in favor? Gary. Uh, disclosure of pecuniary interest, if any. None noted. Uh, moving to the consent agenda, is there any points that a uh, councillor would like brought out for extra attention? Motion for the consent agenda then. Uh, councillor Vaudin. Councillor Stewart. All in favor? Carry. Okay. That uh, moving to 5.1, uh, the Wingham Trail Committee and their annual report to council. You're taking care of that, Phil? I guess so. I couldn't Thank find you. any other volunteers. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, the report's in your package, uh, Reed Vincent, and members of council, and thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come again this year. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing the only member of the committee that could make it with me tonight, and that's Sharon Weber, and Sharon probably does more work in the park than, than anybody, so certainly certainly more than me. But what I'd like to do is just summarize uh, some of the volunteer work that we did do this year. Uh, as, you noted, as I noted in the report, it was approximately 124 hours, but I'm sure it was probably more than that, because we really didn't track that closely, and I'm sure that half of those hours were done by, by Sharon. So. Um, some of the things that we did uh, uh, that we did work on this year was we did pay for some shrubs to be planted in the park along the Cedar Rail fence um, and help the library put in the story trail that they have there, uh, repaired the Cedar Rail fence, and uh, <clears throat> helped install some signs along the trail. Some of our newer community members got lost, so they approached the rec department about getting some more signage. and. Hopefully they don't get lost anymore. So those were some of the, the basic uh, things that we did. I, I just really like to uh, talk about why we volunteer our time. And uh, we do um, enjoy contributing our time. We think it's part of being our responsibility as a, being a citizen in the community is to give back. Uh, the trail and the park are well used by the community. We get lots of positive feedback uh, when we're working in the park or along the trail. Uh, I've included a picture of uh, the young people and the families who helped uh, the trail committee and TD uh, Bank uh, with the planting that we did at the soccer fields in Lower Town. That's property that's leased by uh, North Huron uh, because I think they represent our future and uh, they have a different perspective on uh, what's important in the community. Unfortunately, they aren't likely to attend a council meeting or a public meeting to tell you what they think or what's important, uh, unlike other groups are who uh, do show up, which is maybe a different demographic. So for the uh, new councillors in attendance, I would encourage uh, them to reach out to the younger generation before making any major decisions that will impact uh, future generations, uh, because that's who you should be doing it for, is, is future generations. <coughs> So just in closing, I'd like to thank council, uh, especially those on council uh, who uh, will not be serving for the next four years. Uh, we appreciate the time and dedication that you have uh, made to North Huron and uh, wish you all well in the future. So with that, Revenza, I'll open up to any questions or comments. Yeah, it looks like it was pretty well described in the report, but the when there's only two of you from the committee here, on behalf of council, I want you to take our thanks back to them uh, for the work that they do and uh, helping keep uh, our community a beautiful place to live. I will do that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, for 5.2, uh, we will have a motion to adjourn the council meeting so we can go into the public meeting for the uh, community improvement planning public meeting. Councillor Site, Councillor Vaughan for that. All in favor? Harry. Okay.
the board of the planning advisory committee the call to order disclosure of pecuniary interest if any none noted the requirement for the public meeting this public meeting is required to be held pursuant to the planning act rso 1990 as amended which requires that council shall hold at least one public meeting and that all property owners within 120 meters or 400 feet of the affected area shall be given notice of the meeting by the clerk of the municipality. <clears throat> Pursuant to the Planning Act, RSO 1990, uh, as amended, council shall forward to such boards, commissions, authorities, or other agencies as council considers may have an interest in the proposal sufficient information to enable them to understand it generally. The purpose of this public meeting is to meet the requirement for holding a public meeting under section 28 of the Planning Act for council's authorization of a community improvement plan and to consider the draft North Huron Community Improvement Plan drafted by Laura Simpson. Okay, Laura, do you want to take over there? So good evening, Council. Welcome to the public meeting for the North Huron Community Improvement Plan. The purpose of tonight's meeting is a short summary of the final version of the North Huron Community Improvement Plan, um, a review of the process of drafting the CIP and the project area mapping, reviewing comments and feedback received through the process thus far for the CIP, discussing requests received during the, um, that consultation process and receiving comments, and hopefully approving the proposed CIP and passing the three bylaws required for it. So what is a community improvement plan, otherwise known as the CIP? Section 28 of the Planning Act authorizes council to have the ability to create a community improvement plan that identifies a set area within a municipality or the municipality as a whole to be able to create a plan um, with goals and objectives and it should be issuing a grant for private landowners or people who are leaseholders with the authorization, authorization of the landholder to receive this grant from the municipality to achieve these goals. Most commonly, these are for the redevelopment or restoration of commercial facades in a downtown core area. So the history of the development of the North Huron CIP. Back in July, North Huron Council directed staff to prepare a CIP for North Huron. Um, after that, a background report and SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats was, was completed for both Wingham and Blythe, looking at um, physical improvements that could be made, uh, physical benefits that are there, what's lacking within the community with regards to accessibility and pedestrian safety, and as well, um, attractive features that encourage people to enter into the downtown course of these areas. In October, council directed to circulate for the public meeting of this CIP, which brings us to tonight. On October 29th, circulation of the notice of the public meeting was sent to the required agencies and along with the draft CIP posted on the North Round website with the notice for the meeting and as well as also posted in the newspapers. There has been consultation with the Huron, North Huron Economic Development Committee and local BIAs for both Wyndham and Blythe throughout the process in July. And we did also receive comments from the province. Um, the municipal, uh, Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing did also review the CIP and provide comments for it as well. So this is the proposed project area outlined in red for the individual properties in Wingham. Um, through the process of drafting the CIP, it evolved from a downtown core uh, to more of a main street objective. So therefore it encompasses the commercial properties along Josephine Street from North, down to, North Street down to Amberley Road. Um, so you can see it does include properties that are zoned C4, core commercial, community facility, and as well C3 highway commercial and any um, special zone that would also permit commercial use along Josephine as well as this CIP was intended to target commercial properties and revitalize um, the main street of Wingham. So here's the proposed project area for Blythe. 
This does incorporate most of Queen Street up to um, North Street there, and or sorry, not North Street, but and it does also include the road allowance as the gateway was identified um, with the ability to possibly do design directions or other wayfinding or art installations um, that could be applicable in the road allowance or adjacent areas as well as properties. This does also include any zone commercial properties or where there is a commercial entity operating out of as well as community facility. So a large component of the community improvement plan is the commercial facade improvement grant. So this would provide grants up to 50% of improvement costs to a maximum of $10,000 per project. Um, the buildings must be structurally sound. Projects with a distinct visual improvement um, would be to the facade or improving accessibility of the area as these two were identified as large needs in the area um, would be given priority. And applications are made per property, not per building facade which allows um, someone to construct work both on the side, um, the exterior side and the front of the property should they own the corner lot. So um, other aspects of the community improvement plan do recognize that there is uh, potential for um, accessibility measures. Uh, so this would include any ramps, door stops, pushes, or any other accessibility features that could be improved and benefit people who are exploring the downtown streets as well as putting them in live. So here, this does have a short list of eligible projects under the Community Facade Improvement Grant. So repairs of storefronts, including doors and windows, masonry, woodwork, architectural details, awnings, facade painting and cleaning treatments, building signage, lighting, and any possible architectural fees that um, the applicant could incur during the process of having consultation done for what would benefit their building the best, um, especially in keeping with historical details for the area. During the um, public consultation or consultation with the BIAs and the Economic Development Committee, we did receive comments about um, the process and the application of the CIP. So feedback that was received from the initial first come first serve process that would operate the CIP throughout the calendar year was revised as a result of the feedback that created a set intake period of January 1st to February 28th of the calendar year. So those property owners or leaseholders who have the authorization of the property owner who wanted to make an application to receive this grant money under the CIP would have the first two months of the year to submit their application. This would then go to the CIP Review Committee. Um, the term CIP Review Committee was used as a placeholder because um, with the new council coming in and the current councils being dissolved, we don't know if the Economic Development Committee will be reinstated or what form or role they'll play in the municipality. So the CIP Review Committee is imagined as um, a committee that's able to accept and review CIP applications with representatives from Wingham and Blythe and town staff as applicable as well, or as municipal staff as applicable, including myself or anyone else who um, is interested in reviewing them. So the application process uh, beginning in January 1st at end, exit, or sorry, ending on February 28th was discussed as a benefit in that it sets a set period for applicants to submit their application and um, issue the grants early on in the first half of the year. So ideally, March would be the review period for the review committee, and then their recommendations for which grants should be issued would go to council either at the end of March, the second meeting, or in April. This would allow hopefully all of the applicable money that's been channeled towards the CIP to be issued at some point April and May. Um, and be allocated towards projects that could then begin construction during the beginning of the building season that year. <laughs> Applicants have 18 months to complete their project from when they receive their um, grant, so when they receive their uh, grant approval. So by having them know that they'll be receiving a grant in May, this gives them two full building seasons rather than possibly be receiving a grant in near the end of the year but not be having the means to begin until the next building season. This also allows the CIP review committee to approach council at the end of the year knowing exactly how much money they've allocated towards the grant at the beginning half of the year and what requests would be feasible to bring back to council for a budget line as the next year's CIP funds allocation. So as I mentioned, there was um, a consultation done with BIAs and the Economic Development Committee and there was feedback received. So the first was that application intake process and timelines of review and when the recommendation would go from the committee to council. There was also feedback on the application requirement of two contractor quotes um, as part of your submitted application. It was brought to my attention that in smaller communities, it can be difficult to 
find um, contractors who have the times and means to submit multiple quotes, as well as um, just reach out in time for two, especially with a shorter intake period. So that was lower to one. Um, and also it was mentioned that basically, unless some, if someone was um, also submitting their own time and money into their project, they would ultimately go with their preferred contractor rather than a second one they got just for the sake of filling out an application. So that would be one on the application form. Comments from MMH recommended one edit to clarify that the eligibility criteria for the facade grant improve, improvement program is subject to sections 17 and 28 of the Planning Act. Um, and then there were two property specific requests for inclusion to be added to the CIP project areas, one in Wingham and one in Blythe. So the one in Blythe is the Lions Park. This property is zoned community facility and is on the west side of Queen Street. So um, this was indicated that there are increase um, in accessibility features possible for this park and that's why it would be ideal to add to the CIP project area. In Wingham, the Maitland River uh, parklands would be added and this was a request on part of the House and Dam Committee and that there's the op opportunity for beautification projects along this as it is considered part of an entranceway to Wingham. So this is the Lions Park property in Blythe. You can see outlined there in red. So currently this is not added to the CIP project area and this would be a, a request that council can consider tonight and choose to add it in through an amended motion or leave it out and, and have the commercial projects or commercial properties. And these are the two properties identified. So these two are um, North Huron owned. So any, pro any proposed um, grant application or project on them would also require North Huron approval as well because they're owned by the township. So the next steps uh, tonight, since it's the holding of the public meeting, and this is also a request for, request for the adoption of the CIP. After that, if it is passed tonight and the bylaws are passed, then there would be the circulation of the notice of decision. Uh, there is a 20 day appeal period. After that, the decision is final and the plan can be implemented. Hopefully marketing the plan um, in conjunction with other business attraction that's going on in Wingham and Blythe. Uh, this plan could be a benefit, especially to address concerns that were raised during the um, discussion and the SWOT analysis about this, about potential vacancies. This is hopefully going to be used as a tool and an asset to people who are looking to fill vacancies because it can possibly relieve some of the startup costs for those who are looking to relocate a business into a commercial storefront. And then um, applications would begin this January 2019. So my recommended motion is that North Round Council approves the Community Improvement Plan and pass the three accompanying bylaws. The first one will designate the project areas within North Huron. There's the project area in Wingham and the project area in Blythe. Then the second bylaw would adopt the Community Improvement Plan for those identified areas. And the third would be authorizing the Reven Clerk to sign an agreement with AMO to receive the Main Street's Revitalization Fund which is that $42,000 allocated to Wingham, or sorry, allocated to Wingham and Blythe and North Huron to kick off this plan. So, um, so I leave it to you council to debate and discuss about the inclusion of the Lions Park and the Maitland River Park plans as part of the community improvement plan project areas. And as well, um, there is a second request that the 50-50 split of the funds as indicated in the CIP um, is either kept 50-50 between Wingham or Blythe or is put for applications at large. So it's one large pot and it's up to the review committee and council who's approving the grants to issue them basically on merit of application, not as per community. So those are the two items that you want to discuss and I'm happy to pull back up the map for the maps of the projects. Okay. Well, point six in the points that we're going to go through for this uh, planning advisory committee meeting, and that is comments of others. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the township of North York before the bylaw is <coughs> passed, a person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision to the township of uh, North of the Township of North Huron to the Ontario Municipal Board. Well, that's the, 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 the new... Oh, the LPAC. Yeah, uh, one. Uh, and may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the 
the LPAC, unless in the opinion of the board, there are reasonable grounds to add the persons or public body. And members of the public are asked to provide comment at this time. Is there anybody wanting to make comment on the community improvement plan? Okay, thank you. Um, the planning advisory committee members, questions or comments? And Councillor Bond. Uh, I raised a question some time ago when we were discussing this about the, uh, the former approach to community improvement plans. Uh, people seem to think that as long as we uh, paint a few windows and, and uh, sashes and fix the the screens on the front doors and that sort of thing that that's going to attract a huge number of new businesses and so on um, and so i raised the question uh, does the our, our committee uh, realize that we need more than, than just the beautification if we're going to attract more businesses and uh, they've assured me that uh, Indeed, they are looking at, at other avenues for attractive business, as well as uh, the beautification and, and repair of them, uh, the buildings. And that's good. Okay. Uh, any other councillor comments? Uh, councillor Site. I just would like to have, I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand the parklands that are owned i'm trying to understand the pro the procedure of the parklands if a community group came and asked for to do some beautification in that area let's use the parklands as an example or lions park doesn't matter what area um the intention is 50 50. if the municipality owns the property is the intention then that money is then like it, it would, if it, even a community group put it there, they would need approval from, would that building or whatever become property of the municipality? I'm, I'm struggling with that conversation in, because the intention is to give it to the property owner, not the municipality. The municipality is already, if we wanted to beautify the parklands, we'd put money in the budget to do so. So I, I'm not sure if, if the intention is to make sure make it available so that they can come and get money that we are the municipality is enforced to put money into the budget for that beautification. I'm wondering if that's trying to force council to do something as opposed to as opposed to the real necessity of of beautifying the the area. I, I, the, the I'm not sure I understand the the conversation. I just I'm, you've had the conversation, or can you kind of clarify exactly what how that would work? All right. So if um, if a project was proposed on those lands, it would be North Huron approved um, authorization to issue the application because North Huron is the property owner, um, and then basically there would be the cost estimate along with that application of what the proposed project is and how much grant is being requested. Anything that is not part of the grant would come from the person submitting the application, whether that's themselves or on behalf of the, on behalf of the committee. So it would be similar to someone <coughs> who is a leaseholder for a commercial storefront and they want to do something, they need the um, property owner's approval to submit the application, but they're the one putting the money out for their sign, their awning, et cetera. As far as um, if it was a building or anything constructed, I guess that would be through North Huron, um, because that would be on, it would be on their property. Okay. Anything further to that? Uh, Councillor Stewart. Just for clarification for Council, the, the Lions Park, it's it's not necessarily owned, it is owned by the Lions Club. Like based on that, you know, I'm okay yeah, as a as a counselor, I'm okay with adding those areas in inside the CIP. The, the the real the economic development group, the real concern was at making sure that these 
the locations in the CIP didn't have a residential component to it. So residential owners who lived in that area couldn't apply for money to, to fix, to do facade improvements. It had to be a, com uh, com a commercial product uh, property. So you know, the fact that one, we own the parklands that, you know, if, if a group wants to beautify it, you know, I'm, I'm okay with uh, with potential of, of that requirement. And with regards to the Lions Club, Club Park, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be the Lions Club that comes and requests the information. Um, so, you know, community group, that's the intention. The intention of this was to be uh, owners and community groups that can get support from community, uh, community minded people and the uh, owners of those properties to to, to get towards some beautification. So, you know, I'm okay with adding those uh, as, a, as an increase in a location. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Plus. So just following up on that, we, we need to be clear, uh, probably at, at this table, as to what our stance is in terms of supporting uh, that kind of proposal from a community group. Um, if I may, I'll say that is something similar to the Belgrave uh, Community Center Board, that where there are changes made, notification has to be made to the township as to what the, is it, change or improvement is being made and that those things that need uh, township approval uh, to actually go ahead, such as when we put the accessible doors in and things like that. Uh, a lot of them maybe are no-brainers, that they're good for the community, they're good uh, to have them done, but legality is the official owner has to be notified and that if they're in approval uh, things are good if they don't want it done it should not be done but uh, it's just following the, the line of ownership uh, did you have something else trevor no, I, I just, my, my comment is I think we, the, the intention of the CIP is exactly what its intention was. And as long as there's ownership is acceptable to those changes, then 50% of the money has got to come from the applicant. So, you know, that's, that's the, that's the ticker of, of, the, of the community group or whatever has to come up with 50% of the money. And, and again, the argument other is, is it's an application. It's not a guarantee. Just because you put the application in does not guarantee you that you're going to be successful. I think those are all good points. Is there anything further? Laura? Um, I guess my other point um, uh, from discussion that happened after the submission of this report was uh, council's stance on, on the available funds. If they should remain as indicated in the report, always 50-50 to Wingham and Glen for each project area, or if it should be a collective fund that is basically distributed amongst applications received. And one the council way has one way or another. So whether that is, um, if there is a significantly more number of applications received in Wingham per one year than Blythe, the funds do end up more in Blythe, but next year could prove the opposite. Well, Personally, I think merit-based is, is something that uh, definitely needs to be looked at. That uh, uh, if if there isn't people making application in one place or the other, uh, the merit-based would cover that and uh, allow the best projects to be done, no matter where they're situated in the municipality. I would prefer it to be at large. Um, that's that's my preference, only because 
you know, for just for that exact reason. It, it ties the hand of the committee of, of whatever, if you have 50% one and 50% the other, it really does tie the hand of the committee or the review panel to say, oh, you can only take this amount because what happens if you don't have any any applicants from that area? Then then you're kind of stuck with, with that intent, that intention. So, you know, obviously the committee is going to have their own Merit based and, and, and that they're, they're going to have to justify all these uh, as well. And, it, and it's going to have representation from probably council and staff and a whole bunch of other people. So I think there are going to be lots of comments received about what's the merit based, but I think the at large is the best approach to go. Okay, I, I think that is a strong consensus. And I do have um, amended motions reflecting council's discussion tonight. So okay. to assist you with your motion. Okay. Okay. I will go through uh, public meeting procedure following the uh, public meeting. <coughs> this is a public meeting of the planning advisory committee, not a council meeting. Thus, a decision of council may or may not be made this evening. If the bylaw is passed by council, the clerk is required to send notice of the passing of the bylaw to all persons and agencies notified of this public meeting. There is a 20 day objection period from the time notice of passing of the bylaw has been mailed by first class post, wherein submissions or letters of objection or support in respect of the passing of the bylaw will be received by the clerk. If an objection is received, an appeal is lodged with the local planning appeals tribunal, and that at that point, the township no longer has any control over the time factor involved. If the bylaw is passed and no objections are received within the objection period, the clerk certifies that the bylaws are in force and of effect as of the date of passing, and the notice is forwarded to Huron County Planning and Development Department. And uh, recommendation of the Huron County Planning and Development. Uh, you have already uh, stated that. Yes. Uh, do you want to do any further? Or? Um, just that I have the amended motion. So if council chooses sure. to include Lions Park and the Maitland River Park lands, as well as um, edit the CIP to include the funds available at large for application. That's indicated in the red text there. The blue is the original motion. Um, so that's added there. Motion to me. And that would be my recommendation based on um, recommending that the CIP is approved, the bylaws are passed, and council's discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Sight? I'll, look, I'll uh, move the amended motion. Okay. And Councillor Hallahan seconding? Yes. Any further discussion? Uh, Councillor Stewart? Just a question. Uh, if the motion is passed, the, the maps that are included in the bylaw don't include those two added properties, so the maps will be updated. They will be, yes. And then this material, um, the CIP and the mapping, as well as the application and background report, will be all available on the North Carolina website. Yep. Mm -hmm. All in favor of the motion? Carried. Thank you, Council. Okay. Motion for adjournment of the Planning Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, Councillor Vlad and Councillor Stewart, all in favor? Carried. Okay. Uh, we need a motion to go back into uh, the Council meeting. Councillor Seif, Councillor Rex McMinga. All in favor? Here. Okay. Um, moving to 6.11 and uh, the election of a deputy reeve uh, with an amendment to the procedural bylaw. Dwayne, you're going to go through this? Sure. Thanks, Reeve. Uh, so in preparation for the 2018 to 2022 Council inaugural meeting, staff uh, have reviewed the township uh, procedural <coughs> bylaw 
And in particular, there was a section 5.2 E of the bylaw uh, that we wondered whether or not it was in compliance with the act. Uh, we consulted with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing uh, and they confirmed that uh, we needed to make some changes. Uh, it was also suggested that we uh, look at uh, amending the definition for Deputy Reeve, just so it's clear and doesn't cause any confusion for any of the readers. Uh, we, um, so just for the benefit of those, the past practice has been to elect a Deputy Reeve at the inaugural session uh, through a secret ballot process. As we determined, we can't do the secret ballot process for the election of the Deputy Reeve. Um, it can be done in open council, for sure. So we consulted with other municipalities just to come up with some other alternatives. And it turns out that a lot of municipalities follow the same practice or have followed the same practice of, of the secret ballot. So we put have put together reports and there's kind of two options there in terms of selection of the deputy reeve. The first basically indicates that uh, the deputy reeve could be decided by who obtains the most votes during the previous municipal election, which is the election from this past uh, month. Um, option two uh, is that any member uh, who would like to pursue the position deputy reeve can put their name forward and then council would then uh, go through a process whereby elect a deputy reeve. Um, if you go with option two, which is important to note that it would be done in open council. Uh, you would not be doing it through secret ballot anymore. So those are a couple of options for council's consideration. Um, and we do have a draft amended bylaw on the council agenda. Uh, the draft amended bylaw includes option one, but if council favors not option one and wants to go to option two, uh, that's easily done. We'll just amend the bylaw before we pass it. Councillor Sun, um, I'm I'm a bit concerned. In the like option one is fine if you have equal electorates amongst your wards. We don't. Um, you're basically that that option is basically saying. The person from Wingham, a Wingham ward, is always going to be the deputy reem unless they decline. That that's what it tells me, because you're not going to get the they have, the electorate for Wingham ward is a whole lot bigger than Blythe, Annie, Swalmash. So, so in that sense, I don't I understand the fact that if they decline, then it can be opened up. But the but the the whole essence is is that that's already. The, the world is going to know in North Huron that the deputy reeve is probably going to be from the Wingham Ward unless that individual declines it. Uh, Councillor Bond. I, I think if, if we went for that option, uh, the only fair way would be to use a percentage of the, of the uh, electorate. And the two is the sort of highest percentage. But I, I'm not really in favor of number one anyway. I think it, number two makes a, a whole lot of sense. Is there any other councillor, councillor Allahan? I'm in favor of uh, councillor Slade's <coughs> direction. That from many years of uh, council and uh, over a long period of time, the county council used to be done by voting in open. It's just the same as if we were going through a recorded vote and that uh, it's, you just make up your mind who you're voting for and you vote in public. There's, everything's clearly out in the open. Although county council has since went to doing secret ballot because an upper tier can do that. Um, that I don't see any drawbacks of having people that want to do it and choosing amongst them in the open. That's as transparent as you can get. And Unfortunately, many first time people 
top the pole. And it would be truly unfair to move them ahead in the hierarchy uh, that they were not prepared for. Uh, sometimes people are prepared, but most of the time that person that stepped forward uh, for the first time to accept public office, they want to go through the training ground, which is being a counselor before they're pushed forward to having to chair meetings if the chair is unavailable and things like that. So that I would strongly recommend the second option and skip the high ballot uh, total. I agree. Is you want a motion to that effect, do we? Yes. Okay. Trevor, are you yeah, so all, all wanting all, to make that motion? Yeah, I'll move the motion uh, with the amendment that we use option two. Your seconding, Ray? Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried. Okay. Uh, 6.1.2. Uh, Laura and Kurt together, who's leading off? Uh, it's uh, dealing with the GJAJ Holdings Limited uh, Subdivision Development Agreement. Sure. Um, so a quick refresher on this is the plan of subdivision for GJAJ Holdings Limited is in North Flat. Um, this plan of subdivision was deemed the application for the plan of subdivision was deemed complete on in December uh, 2017 and was also received with an accompanying zoning amendment which was approved in February 2018 and the plan of subdivision was granted draft approval by Huron County in, in March 2018. The plan of subdivision has a total of 16 lots and six blocks with a uh, variety of residential density on it and would also include the, a new interior road that would extend from North Street um, to the current access onto Queen Street. So uh, when the, the um, subdivision was granted draft approval, it included conditions that must be completed by the developer to the satisfaction of a variety of agencies, including the county, MBCA, and North Huron. Uh, one of the conditions was that um, the the condition was that there was the completion of a development or subdivision agreement between the developer and North Huron, which is presented to you tonight. So this development agreement is enter an agreement entered into between North Huron and the developer to ensure clarity on the standards of the development and a variety of the components of the infrastructure in the proposed development, including water supply, sewage disposal, lot grading and drainage, stormwater management, landscaping, utilities, etc. So the development is for council consideration tonight. And um, my planning comment was that section 5126 of the Planning Act allows uh, municipalities to enter into agreement for conditions imposed by subdivision. Rick will also have some drainage content. Good evening, Reed, council members. Uh, my comments in front of you tonight are with respect to the Whitfield drain. Quite some time ago, it was in front of council and um, discussed the the entire length of the Whitfield drain, um, how it outlets onto private property and not to a sufficient outlet, which would be the Blythe Creek. <clears throat> we have been in discussion with the, the engineer for the developer, making them fully aware that there is potential that we may request a section 78 for changing the course of drainage works, and that would run parallel to abandoning a section of the Whitfield drain and that section would be from the south end of this proposed development to the north property line of the properties that front onto Thule Street. So abandoning the, the closed 14 inch pipe and then we would turn the existing swale or natural water course into an open municipal drain. This would then the proposal would be to then go right to the Blythe Creek, allowing for future maintenance on that swale. And that swale would then possibly accommodate any future development that may uh, spark to the 
east of this proposed development. Uh, but I just wanted to be uh, forthcoming with the, the developer and the engineer on what possibilities may be on the horizon. Uh, further ahead back. Okay. Uh, Deputy Reeve Gamble. To the Reeve through you. Sure. Is the landowner of this quite knows right up front that there, there could be a possibility here? Like who's yeah, going who's going to look after the maintenance of this open drain? Well the municipality will have to be obligated to look after the maintenance for it. Once it turned into a municipal drain, that's just like municipal infrastructure. Councillor Hallahan. So this would be assessed as a as a municipal right from the development to the outbound. That's not going to change. <clears throat> yeah, so through the section 78 report through appointing an engineer, the engineer would do a new assessment schedule for all the properties within the watershed boundary as per the open municipal drain, which would go from the south end of the development to the Blythe Creek. And when the the existing pipe would be abandoned, we would abandon it almost at the corner, southeast corner of the proposed development. Right now the existing pipe goes across the, the development lands right at the bottom of southeast corner. If elevation works out close or there too, the existing pipe would be right at or near the bed of the natural water course right now. So all of the upstream lands would out that into the natural water course, which would be turned into a municipal drain. Councillor Stewart. Just, uh, I guess, to clear this my own mind, the municipal drain now runs to Thule Street. There's a section from Thule Street to the, the, the Blythe Creek that's on private property and not part of the municipal drain. The existing municipal drain stops at the north rear lot line of the private property on Thule Street. Right. Because the section from Thule Street to the Blythe Creek on private property, um, the drain there was installed not that many years ago. And it was not part of the municipal drain, but it, uh, it was installed through the municipality, I guess, to, uh, to take the water that was coming down the Whitfield drain, picking that up and directing it to the, the Blythe Creek. And it's, it's a closed section of drain from there, it's not an open ditch. There's approximately 150 feet roughly of closed pipe, 48 inch in size. Yes, from through Old South. And that it opens up into an open swale. Right here to the black tree. Okay. Councilor Vaughn. I, I don't know much about drains, but uh, <coughs> the cost of this operation would be apportioned to all of people who, who have ownership within the watershed through that, boundary. Through that watershed. Yeah. Yes. And uh, is there any idea of what, what those apportions would be? Or no. No, no I, I would not even attempt to. Hazard. Not even percentages. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Worth a try. <laughs> uh, Deputy Reeve Campbell. Just one other question. You and I have already talked about this. A municipal drain legally cannot drop onto a piece of property, give them all that water. And that's, that's basically what has <clears throat> happened here. Surface water does not have the right to flow. Collected surface water does not have the right to flow on lower land. Mr. Stewart. Um, in the subdivision agreement, uh, and I apologize, I went through it very quickly, but is there any place in there which makes it clear that the, the developer uh, and the municipality has their own separate lawyer and their own separate engineer um, I've seen it in the past where an engineer has worked for both the developer and the municipality and 
it hasn't always worked out the best. I'm just wondering, is there any place in that agreement that clarifies that? I don't think there is. In this case, it is different uh, engineers for the municipality and the developer. And to my knowledge, it's different lawyers as well. In this case, yeah. but so as long as that's the case, that's that's fine. That's, I think it's just something that, if mm -hmm. if it works for this one, great. Uh, but in the future, as other developers come forward, we we want to make sure that um, each party has their own representation. Uh, Independent have, counsel, rather than have one company working for both. Councilor so I do want to ask the question, Kirk. Yeah. The abandoning of the Whitfield drain, it's not just in that saying, you're not just, you don't just stop maintaining it. You would, during that subdivision agreement, would that part of the drain then be removed? Yes. So the section from the rear lot line of the residential lots on Google would be abandoned, removed up to just north of where the proposed development is going to outlet. Right into the open natural <clears throat> water course. Right. And then at that point there, we tie in the existing closed drain into that water course as well. And then it would be all municipal drain. But from there, so open. Right, so, so understanding the fact that the, the, the watershed individuals pay for both the construction of a, of a, of a municipal drain and abandoning of the municipal drain because based on the based on the planning act there is going to be issue instances where um people who are within the watershed are going to have potential both payment of the existing whitfield drain removal and the payment of the creation of the new open ditch municipal drain is that correct? Certainly. Uh, the cost to abandon that drain will be minute okay. compared to the new open ditch going in. Uh, and the engineer that's appointed to look after that project will be assessing the property based on benefit and outlet liability. So not everybody's assessment will be identical. Okay. Yep. Okay. Do I have a mover for uh, six point one point two? Mm -hmm. Deputy. Sorry to interrupt, uh, Ray Vincent. There's one other item that we thought it was prudent to bring uh, to Council's attention. Um, specifically, the, uh, the storm outlet, stormwater outlet that uh, Kirk was referring to, actually discharges into that open natural water course immediately in the center of what would be considered a, a road allowance for future development. Uh, specifically, the property to the east of the, the Rutland subdivision is designated as future development. Uh, we just thought it was prudent to make sure council was aware of this because obviously if in the future that property was to be developed, uh, there would have to be some consideration and cost associated with, with dealing with that. Uh, we've, we've had some discussion. We don't feel it's an insurmountable issue. It may be as simple as putting uh, you know, a standard concrete structure in to collect both the, uh, the field drain water and the, uh, the subdivision, the subdivision uh, stormwater. Just thought it was important that everybody be aware we wouldn't want after the fact to, to, or to be revealed that this discharged into a road allowance. So to do anything with it now would be really an act of speculation because we don't know if that will be developed or if it is when. So you're just stating that there might be Further things, if another development to the east of the current one happens that have to be done 
uh, to move part of the flow away from the center of what could be a roadway. That's precisely it, yes. Just something to be aware of. Yeah, Councilor so there must be some mechanism by which we can overcome the changes of council and changes of staff and so that that's brought to attention when, when any development <coughs> comes to fruition. Through, if it was to be developed, it would be immediately obvious because it's it's de it discharged cool. right into the road line. It's basically into the center right. of the road line. So it would, it's not something that could be overlooked or missed oh, okay. in the planning stage. And no surprise. That's why we're bringing it forward so there would be no surprise. Okay. But basically that would be an adjustment to the drain <coughs> at that time. Uh, I did want to make mention though too is that the comment about the uh, that open swale or the, the, the municipal drain that uh, the proposed municipal drain as Curry was talking about the land that that is the land that that is going into right right beside is municipally owned so currently right now if it if it's not municipally owned um, or if it wasn't municipally owned, and there would be potential erosion that would continually do with with injecting water into that swale. So the intention of that, I think, in my mind, is is that you'd want to make it a municipal drain to ensure that we can maintain it to the proper, so that there isn't that erosion that happens, regardless <clears throat> of whether it's municipally owned or not, um, because I think that would be in the best interest of both. Our, us as the property owner that's right beside it and even if we weren't another property owner who was beside it so well, I think you know Kirk's uh, comments are, are valid and I think I think at that point I don't think it's necessarily we need to jump on the wagon today but I think obviously I think you know those comments to the developer and to this council and most of the council elect that is here tonight keeps them open minded that, that that is a possibility in the future. Uh, you were moving. I was, I'll make a motion. Uh, Councillor Hallahan, seconding. Yes. Is there further comments on this? All in favor of the motion? Carry. Okay, thank you. And moving to 6.2.1, and that is a request to. Infrastructure Ontario to pay off the ESTC loan. I'll let you give some background, Donna. Thank you, Reed. So with the impending sale of the EST facility, we have to deal with the balance of the loan owing. And these debenture loans were not designed to be paid off early and therefore require special permission and the associated penalty to go with that. <clears throat> Um, so as you know, we, we um, had a loan authorized from Infrastructure Ontario in the amount of $1.2 million to finance the construction of the EST building. The loan was issued on April 16, 2012 for a 20-year term at 3.71% interest with semi-annual payments in April and October. So we have made our payments for 2018, so the balance owing is 901,737.82. And there will be an estimated penalty of 34,000 with also accrued interest of about 1,400. So once the exact date of the closing of the sale is known, then the, um, those amounts will be calculated to that date. Um, so in the future, the good news would be that the current annual payments, which include principal and interest in the amount of 85518 would no longer be included in the budget. So um, we did the research on this as part of the negotiations um, during the sale discussions. And as I was saying, we do need to have a special motion um, to approach Infrastructure Ontario to get permission to pay this loan off early um, in order to be able to complete that transaction. Any questions? Councillor Sight? I will move it. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Harry. Thank you, Donna. Um, 
Uh, 6.3.1, and this is a green room for the William Town Hall Theater. Uh, Vicki, do you want to give some background? Certainly, Your Worship. Um, staff have received a written request from the William Town Hall Theater Committee to allow the uh, uh, council chambers and adjoining areas to be used as a green room um, for performances on Friday evenings, Saturdays, and Sundays. Um, prior to uh, the renovations, there had been an agreement, our uh, terms and conditions had been developed um, for the use of the theater upstairs. And due to some issues that had occurred previously uh, with leaving the uh, council chambers uh, in an uh, disarray and uncleanly manner, um, as well as uh, uh, staff. Uh, areas being accessed and, and personal items being used. Um, the terms and conditions uh, indicated that there was to be no use of these areas. This had been reviewed with the Wingham Town Hall Theater <coughs> Committee and had been accepted um, on a concept, conceptual basis and things. Um, now that the theater has been used more um, after the uh, after the renovations and things, what's happened is is they're finding that it's kind of a deterrent for users when they find out their a green room is not available. So they've come forward and asked uh, staff to kind of look at that area, look at the terms and conditions, and reconsider um, what what had been previously decided. Um, staff have discussed uh, their request and feel that if uh, specific measures can be put in place. Um, that we could take a look at this and try it on a trial basis for the uh, next 12 months um, and uh, see how it goes. Uh, what these specific, these specific measures would entail purchasing uh, locks for the filing systems to ensure that those that information is, is secured, um, as well as uh, putting in place a $200 uh, refundable cleanup slash damage deposit, and um, also uh, limiting the use to uh, non-office hours. So it basically be Friday nights, Saturdays, and Sundays. So it wouldn't interfere, sorry, it wouldn't interfere with the business of the corporation. And also that uh, uh, putting staff in place to oversee the usage. And the staffing that would be put in place would be on a cost recovery basis. Um, so there would be no cost to the municipality. But then we could ensure that things are looked after properly. So um, we put before you then their, their request and uh, the written request and for your consideration. Councilor Site? Has the, has the terms of this? been discussed with the Wingham Theater Committee? The uh, the terms of this particular uh, recommendation, no. Um, they had made their suggestion in their letter as to what would, uh, they felt would be fair. Um, we are going on the basis of, for instance, the refundable plan of damage deposit of $200 falls in line with the uh, deposit that's already required for rentals. So we're adhering to that policy so that we wouldn't have to uh, make any changes to the fees and charges by law. Um, we did, in, in proposing the cost recovery, we were considering what the rental rate would be if they would have to rent the room. So we're feeling it, it's along the same lines. Deputy Reed, I'll make a motion. And Councilor Ritzman to then get seconded. Further discussion? Councilor Site? When you say what the, the cost of the staffing on it, so that would be then included in there in, in the invoice to the user that says, here's, my, here's your cost to rent the facility, but oh, here's the cost to have staffing maintain the area in which you need the green room for. Is that correct? Sure. So, so, you, so, the, so, so if I'm if I'm renting the William Hall Theater, 
I'm going to get an invoice that says, mm -hmm. here's your rental rate yes. for the William Town Hall Theater. But if this, if this changes, now you're going to see staff costs relating to the use of the area that's not in the original agreement. Is that what I'm seeing? So through you, Your Worship. So what we're proposing is rather than charge them a rental fee for this room for the actual time that they're using it, mm -hmm. we would just charge them for the cost to have staff here to oversee it. So when they get their, their rental contract, they would get their contract that would be for the theater upstairs but then their contract would state that they would have, there's a staffing cost for the, uh, the use of this room. Councilor Sleep? I am absolutely fine with it as long as it's communicated to the renters beforehand so that they understand that cost is not, when they get the rental agreement, it says $300, that when they get the bill and it says 450 or 375, there's not a, well, what is this cost? What I didn't I don't know what this was. I think as long as we communicate it up front, and even at the time of the of the um, of the actual booking, then I think that would help alleviate the stress that might come with the extra cost if they aren't aware of it. Uh, Councillor Vaughn. Uh, just a, a, a question. It seems to me that there would be groups that uh, could give you complete assurance that everything will be looked after. They, they, they've rented the place often. They've never, there's never been a problem. They're all responsible people and and so on and uh, would there be any way of giving those people a break and not charge not not even requiring a staff time to oversee i'm just wondering if, if there's a, would that be showing favoritism or or I, I, it would be showing favoritism but it, but it could be earned favoritism for you worship um i think that we could look at this uh, again it says this is on a 12 month trial basis so i think that we could look at it again in 12 months and see how um think, how things have progressed and if if we're not having issues with um the groups and things we could we could certainly look at that and, and revisit whether or not the staffing component would be required I think this is a very responsible committee, and I don't think we have any words. I'm 100% in favor of it. They've already proved themselves. You're commenting that if somebody from the theater committee was supervising mm -hmm. rather than staff of the township? Well, if, yes, sir. Through the committee, that, through the that's staff. different than what's that's written. not proposed. Well, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think the request from the committee, they're the ones that's going to be responsible, and they are responsible. Uh, Councillor Sleep. So the way this is, they're not responsible right now. So if 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 I am a musician and I want to rent the facility, it's my responsibility to pay for the rental of the facility and those staffing costs, no, not the Wingham Town Hall the Theater Committee. The committee is not responsible. They're just asking on behalf of the, the, the people who are renting the facility. They think it's a, it's a deterrent for not having the area, so we're not getting as much rentals as we could have. That's what the William Town Hall Theater Committee is asking. They're not responding. I, I would I would probably disagree that the William Town Hall Theater is going to put their name on this and say, I'm going to be responsible to come and supervise the are the people that's asking. Uh, go back to Vicki. I'm sorry. That's okay. Through you, Your Worship. Um, I actually did speak to Doug Kivenhoven uh, regarding this, this letter. 
and um, asked if this group would be the ones who would be responsible, if they were coming forward to be responsible, and he indicated no. It is the individual renters uh, that, that would come forward and would sign the rental agreement. So Councilor Seif is, is correct that the agreement is not with the town hall committee. The rental agreement is with it, with whoever comes forward and wants to rent, rent the facility. They're, they're just looking at facilitating this um, to ensure that, that we're getting as many performances that we can. The importance of having staff here is to ensure the security, the site security, and security of the documents and files that are on, on site here and privacy of information. Thank you. And if I may, <coughs> well, most musical uh, uh, programs wouldn't necessarily use, but in the past there was examples of ones that were doing theatrical, and there was a pile of glitter that was very hard to remove, that uh, basically you have to go to a commercial cleaning uh, business to have the products that will lift things like glitter and uh, makeup if it gets into the carpet. So that's what the $200 uh, damage or cleaning expense would be for is if something like that happened. Uh, basically, we're not wanting to charge them, but if there is damage to the municipality's property, uh, we have to hold somebody responsible for it. And that's why the charge is there. Councilor Hyde. So I assume that a group that does not need a green room would not be charged for this. Correct. Right. Okay, good. All in favor of the motion? Carried. Thank you, Vicki. Okay. Uh, 6.4.2 Amendments to the Cross Border Servicing Agreement with Morris Turnberry. Oh, sorry. Sean, I was trying to get you off easy. We, we may be better do 6.4.1. The Blythe Downtown Core Snow Removal. Thank you, Vincent. Um, yes, this is this is a report that's been a long time coming. Uh, last winter, uh, there were concerns expressed by some uh, commercial property owners in Blythe stating that um, because of the schedule of snow removal that we were sticking to, which was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday type of an agreement or uh, schedule, there was concerns over health and safety for the residents because the Blythe commercial area is a fairly condensed area. Uh, there was concerns with people trying to get over, in and out of their cars and over snow banks and that sort of thing. So uh, Public Works was asked to look at, the, um, look at the concerns and see if there was a solution. Um, after much discussion and deliberation, we've got this proposal that we would put before council. <clears throat> we looked at the uh, what we believe was the area of concern, and that was specifically the high density area, which is between Drummond Street and Kane Street. Uh, this is the area that has the, the uh, highest uh, uh, density in terms of business. It's got the highest <coughs> amount of parking uh, or demand on parking, and certainly from our perspective, uh, the highest pedestrian traffic. So we suggested that for this central area, again, from Drummond Street to King Street, uh, Public Works would commit to um, five day a week ensuring that the snow banks were, were cleaned and removed. The trade-off in this is that in the past, when we were going with the alternate day uh, method, they went further. They went a couple blocks to the north and south as well. Uh, in those areas, obviously, the density, the parking, the, the, the pedestrian traffic, it's much less. There are places that they can move the snow in the interim. They'll blow snow onto front lawns and that sort of thing. Uh, so we felt that that was, or we certainly hoped that that would be an acceptable trade-off. 
there are certain challenges to this, and uh, you know, without belaboring it, in order to make sure that we do snow removal whenever it's needed, we have to bring crews in early. Uh, so basically, the first uh, individual starts at three, and then the rest of the crew starts no later than four o'clock. The idea is to get the snow off the sidewalks onto the road and then removed before the traffic picks up. Uh, so the challenge is that then if if we've got all of our, our resources, all of our human resources in at three and four in the morning, their shift is done between 11 and 12. So if you do start seeing inclement weather coming in at 10, 11 o'clock, and we hold them uh, hold them in to manage that to meet minimum maintenance standards, obviously there's the potential for overtime. Uh, the other piece was they went to this staggered uh, schedule in the hopes of reallocating resources on the off days. So if we were into a situation where we had to do five day a week snow removal, obviously it's going to be all hands on deck for Blythe. Um, the caveat in this is that it's very easy to look at it and say, okay, well then they're going to be removing snow five days a week. Well, we're not. We're removing snow on weekdays where it's deemed necessary. So, you know, in the worst of the winter, uh, we could be doing this five days a week. You get into the outlying months and it could be one or two days a week. So we thought that this might be a, a suitable compromise to, to ensure <coughs> that the uh, health and safety concerns were met um, while hopefully minimizing overtime or, or maybe lack of attention to other uh, deserving areas. And the, uh, the one other thing I would, uh, I would mention is that uh, we would obviously have to monitor this. And if we found that there was a, a cost impact, um, it would behoove me to come forward to, uh, to council to, to <coughs> outline the fact that this new program was actually incurring cost. And then there'd have to be some method put in place to deal with that or, or decision to, to, to step back from it. But in the in the short term, I think that this uh, or we're hoping that this would be found as an acceptable uh, solution to what was considered a serious problem last year. Councillor Stewart, uh, I guess first of all, I, I do understand the uh, the human element in this. We don't want employees working seven days a week. And we don't want employees constantly working overtime. But I I do have some concerns. Um, with the, the snow, if the snow banks accumulate on the main street, it's not just that people have to climb over those snow banks to get to the, the store. I mean, they, they do that in other municipalities and get by with it. It's not ideal, but it does happen. My biggest concern is because the street is so narrow that it's difficult for traffic to meet. And we do get a lot of truck, truck traffic down the main street with uh, house and mills. Uh, trucks running fairly steadily. In the winter time, if you have snow banks on both sides of the street, two trucks cannot meet. It's it's basically one lane traffic. A truck and a car can meet if they're both very careful. Two cars, they have to be careful. So that's that's the main reason when we go back years ago when we decided to move remove snow from the main street was because we had to keep the street widened out for the traffic. Um, I also have a concern with the weekends, Saturday and Sunday, particularly when we have uh, performances at the Memorial Hall, whether it's through 1419 or through the Blythe Festival, uh, the cars park on the main street. And if the snow is not removed, if we have a heavy snowfall on the Friday night, it's not removed for Saturday, we have a performance there, then we have... Uh, mass confusion on the main street with people trying to park and, and get to the theater. Uh, I guess I, I also have a concern with uh, the parking, um, the extended parking from Drummond to Westmoreland. Again, mainly on the weekends, uh, that it, those parking areas are used extensively for people going to the Memorial Hall. Uh, parking from um, King Street to Wellington Street, again, it's a widened area, but on Sunday with the Christian Reform Church, uh, their parking lot is not big enough to, to uh, accommodate all their vehicles, they park on the main street. 
So I'm hoping that there is some way that if we go with this plan, that if there's major events going on in Blythe on the weekends, that we can somehow accommodate those to make sure the streets are clear. And I realize that's going to mean staff working weekends, staff being called in overtime, but I, I don't see any other way around it. I, I think it would be, um, it would be a difficult position to put council in and to put uh, event holders such as 1419 in if, uh, again, we had a major snowstorm on a Friday night and you had something major going on on Saturday that uh, you need those streets kept clear. So those are my thoughts. <coughs> uh, I second those thoughts. <clears throat> Um, we had a significant snowfall, not a huge snowfall this past week, but uh, um, the uh, streets were cleared this morning. Um, the loader went past my apartment at 3.22 this morning. So they were, they were out early this morning, but it, it has been several days. And I'm not, I'm not raising a complaint, I'm just pointing out that the system is working and uh, as the snow, as the winter progresses, I'm sure we'll we'll have uh, lots of service, and hopefully that we can re realize some of the benefits on the weekend as well. Deputy Reeve Campbell, through you, Reeve to, to Sean, do you have any idea the extra cost that this will be in our snow removal? Through you, Reeve Vincent, uh, this is entirely weather dependent. So if we have an easy winter, then the impact could be less. So I really, I, I don't think I could come up with any kind of a number looking at the past days. Councillor Snyder. So uh, I completely agree with with uh, Councillor Stewart's assessment about what we. The concerning part is, is there's lots of what ifs. What if it snows on Friday night at eight o'clock? What if it snows on Friday night at twelve o'clock? Damn. Then, like our way, I read this here is there isn't that that ability to turn it on and off when those things happen. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The way I'm reading it is, it's a Monday to Friday. That's the time. If we don't, then then what happens to those other areas? And I and I, I completely agree with Councillor Stewart. There's a concerns there, but I, I don't know who's like who would be then responsible to mitigate that risk versus versus you know what making the call to say, well we've just got seven feet of snow today. Maybe we should do it. Going to Sean. Yes, thank you, Reed Vincent. There's a couple issues here. First off, minimum maintenance standards don't yield for our schedule. So, nope. you know, if we do get that seven feet of snow, uh, all resources are going to be mobilized. Um, one so, of the big challenges, the, and the weekend is a particularly challenging issue, specifically because uh, for our operations supervisor, one of his duties is to make sure that he's using the manpower that we have in compliance with various regulations. Specifically, we can't keep the guys on the road non-stop. So there's a certain period of time where, where we have to allow them to stand out uh, under regulations. So that's why we were very reluctant to put the weekend on the table because in order to, you know, in that case where you've got the seven days of snow in a row, we have to adhere to minimum maintenance standards we may not have the resources available that we can legally pull because uh, we have we actually bring some seasonal people in so that we can stagger to ensure that, uh, that nobody's exceeding that 60 hours of operating in a, in a, uh, in a one week period, that sort of thing. So there may be situations where we can deal with it on, on one-offs, but to actually say that we would schedule to do seven day a week snow removal, I think it would be for, for me to sit here and, and say I, that the crew could do that would be inappropriate. I don't believe that we could 
make that guarantee. No, sir, Roger. I have to admit that <clears throat> Blythe has given North here a terrible problem. <clears throat> We've had terrible staff members when we had the village of Blythe. They wouldn't adhere to the hours. We had uh, 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 one of our employees used to uh, drive around every Sunday and pick up trash in front of people's houses or leaves or branches. And that was, he was not on the payroll. He was just doing this for the community. We had people who, uh, without uh, thought of, of hours or anything, uh, slept overnight at the, at the uh, utility hall uh, so they'd be able to get up at two, two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning to get out and, uh, and get to work. So we've inherited that terrible problem of staffing that we uh, that were developed in, in Blythe and we, we still in Blythe would love to have those efficiencies and efforts and be able to applaud them and appreciate them and so on and uh, I'm, I'm sorry that it's given us such a terrible difficulty in, in these days. Okay, uh, Councillor Sight. The one, the one thing that I, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if is, is, is sometimes this all relates to communication. How we communicate snow events to, to our residents and our ratepayers, because, the, you know, we, we, we put this recommendation in, and. The, the, the intention of this is all good, and then the snow event happens, and everybody's going to look at this with a fine tooth comb and say, This isn't happening the way we wanted it to happen. I guess the question is, is How do we communicate? How does the public works, or how do we communicate the standards that we have set to the rate payers who are questioning them? so that we make sure that they are well aware of, you know, minimum maintenance standards, that type of stuff, regulations, the, the employment regulations that require us not to allow somebody to work 60 hours. Like, these are the types of things that, you know, the general public may not be completely aware of, and I'm not suggesting they should be all aware of, but I think the argument is, how do we communicate these significant events in the sense that, you know, because we are, there is going to be that event where we are going to get Sean or Stu or whoever is going to get the, the, the email that says, well, according to your bylaw, it didn't, it, you didn't get this done when you were supposed to. So how do we communicate that? And I guess that's my question to Sean is how do we get that, the, that information out to the rate payers and Blythe, and not necessarily Blythe, in Wingham and in, in East Walla, how do we communicate these snow events that 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 might be a little easier for them to 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 to, to fathom? Three years, Vincent. Yeah, and that's a very good question uh, that the councillor asks. And I really, I think, I have to stress the fact that minimum maintenance standards are paramount. So there, I can basically give a guarantee that there will be days this coming winter that my phone rings off the hook where they say you said you would but if we have to make sure the roads are open and the sidewalks are open that's what we have to do first what this proposal says is that okay we we, we had an all hands on deck snow event we handled it as soon as we took care of that in the next following business day we got the snow off there and that's that's the intent I, I don't believe, I, it was never my understanding that the, the request was that at all times the, there will be no snow on the main streets. So as, for, as for how you broadcast that, I'm not sure, but if nothing else in this arena, I hope that it's understood that minimum maintenance standards are, are absolutely critical. We have to make sure that the, our, our communities are safe before we remove the snow. And I think Sean may be familiar with minimum maintenance standards. But you go to the tables and start figuring out which are the applicable ones. Uh, is mind bending in, in the very broad terms because 
it depends on the number of traffic units in the tw in a tw normal 24 hours and it uh, goes with as to how many inches of snow there is before it needs to be plowed and there's that other thing we are trying to go with the number of units that we deem needed if we have one unit down that means a number of the other units have to do a few more miles of road, uh, I'll say in the, or a few more streets if any of them go down. I believe we would still be meeting minimum uh, maintenance standards, but minimum maintenance standards means that there is a roadway open for emergencies and that that's how minimal that gets when you go, go back to the definition of minimum. Uh, I believe what I said is true. Uh, Councillor Hallahan. Tom, Tom, is there a possibility that, I'm just putting this out there, that we should be hiring more staff? Because I'm reading this as saying, because we're going to get the streets cleared and by, maybe seven days a week we have to, it's going to reduce the service in East Palm and Ash, and that's what it's saying here. Yeah, that's what it's saying. The report. So this, they've got to accommodate, how much can you reduce I know in Mall and Ash, because for people that's going to work 24 hours a day, you might say, okay, plus we got milk trucks, and there's, or there's you know, stuff that has to move seven days a week. Three, just to clarify, that's reduction of additional tree trimming that, you know, the other work. It's, again, um, all, uh, all of our resources are first and foremost put towards keeping the roads open. So the, the intent of this is not to say, sorry, we're not, we're not dispatching plows or graders in EW because we're, we're moving snow and blight. It would be more... Uh, what they were, what the practice was is on that Tuesday or the Tuesday and the Thursday, they might say, okay, you know what, we're not removing snow today, so let's go and do some more tree trimming or let's focus. It could be somewhere else in Blythe, it could be somewhere else. But no, it's nothing to do with the, so, the roads. And I apologize if that wasn't clear. <coughs> uh, okay. Again, the roads are parallel. No, sir, so I will move it. Is that Councillor Ritzman to Linda. I just, I just want Go to ahead, then. And let me make a comment here. I know I'm just a young fellow, but I do remember times in East Walmos, Deshaun, that the roads weren't open for a week. And at the end of that week, the farmers were asked to go out with their tractors and snowblowers to open roads so we could get milk out. We had milk. We held for a week. And I remember that quite well. And I remember the days I spent trying to open side roads so the cows could get through. Okay. Just, just no, yeah. they say it, it does happen. I believe that's down to three days is all you can hold milk now. I think is that's that right. Correct? You'll you'll be hearing from uh, <laughs> I need to hear when the cow needs to come. There were days we went and met the plow and met the milk truck to get the milk out. None of this is going to affect us, Jim. No, because Blythe has to clean, keep the street clean policy. The rest of us don't have to keep the roads clean. Okay. All those in favor of the motion? Or did you have... I'd like to make a comment, please. Go ahead. You. Uh, I would support this motion if there was some accommodation that uh, an event is being held at the, the Memorial Hall or in the downtown area of Blythe. Uh, on a weekend, and there's a significant f snowfall prior to that, that there can be some accommodation made to clear the streets uh, for that significant activity. If I may, and that, Sean, that wouldn't be on the, a the, the most I think that you can put into writing is that the staff will try and accommodate 
beds, resources are available. And I, th I think that you have staff that would be quite willing to treat it in that manner as resources could be available, it would be done. I don't think that's an answer to Councillor Stewart's proposal. I mean, maybe well, maybe we maybe we need a policy of uh, of uh, seeking additional workers to come in on a, a, a need needs basis when this situation is going like this. Now, I know it's not easy to find operators who uh, are, are willing to work on a, on a part-time basis, but uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really serious, serious issue. Uh, and it's an issue not just for uh, people coming to the theater, it's the safety of the people who are, are coming and parking there and, and uh, so on. It, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a serious issue. That admittedly, I would be making the decision on it, but at the Blythe BIA annual meeting, I said that if there was considerably above normal maintenance in other parts of the municipality, the new council will have to seriously take a look at if one board is getting preferential treatment there will have to be area rating on a certain amount of uh, if it's treatment that neither of the other two wards can get. It's our site. But, the, but overall, the issue is, is not the fact that Blythe wants a different level of service because they have the same safety, as, safety concerns as Wingham does. I get the, the reason for the request is because of the small the size of the road. Like if the size of the road was the same as in Josephine Street and Wingham, we wouldn't be having the discussion at all. So the question is, is can something be implemented in the policy that would indicate that if a snow event occurred at that time and public works could be notified in some respect, if it's possible to complete, could public works complete the job? I guess is the question I think Councillor Stewart is asking. If 1419 or the Blythe Festival called and said, we had a snow event yesterday, or you've been doing something, the, the supervisor's already on his doing his surveying of the area. The issue is, is that public works may not always know when an event is happening at 1419 or the Blythe Festival. So the question is, is there some kind of level of communication between those groups and public works that says when there's an issue, we can communicate and if you there is resources available, could this occur? I don't know if that's going to satisfy the discussion, but to me that's the only thing that public works could have that would deviate from this but ultimately have the responsibility to say, no, we don't have the resources in order to accommodate because of X, Y, and Z. Sorry, but we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to deal with it another way. I think that uh, communication is the, the ideal thing. I mean, if I'll use 1419 for an example. If 1419 has an event scheduled for the third Saturday in January, I mean, they've got to contact municipal office or, or through Sean to Sean to say, we have this event coming up. It's three weeks away. If we have a snowfall Friday night, is it possible for you to clear the, the streets uh, Saturday morning? So because we're holding this event. If it doesn't snow, great. But if it does, at least we've made that communication. And I trust that, that Sean will make every attempt to do so. Whether it can be done or not is another question, but he'll make every attempt to do so. I don't think it's reasonable to suggest that, uh, and again, I'm only using 1419 as an example, for them to phone at 
quarter to five on a Saturday night, say, hey, we've got an event here at seven o'clock, and you come and clean the street. Well, that's not reasonable, and I don't think anybody should be expecting that. And, and I and maybe shouldn't have used 14, 19 for an example. That's probably going to get to the newspaper, but um, <laughs> you understand what I mean, that you have to communicate well in advance so that uh, public works knows that three weeks, a month down the road, I mean, these events are booked a long period, period ahead, so th three weeks, a month down the road, we have an event coming up, Let's see if uh, if there is something major happens as far as weather goes that so we can accommodate. Councilor Sully. So I guess the question is: Is there some? We have we North Huron has a community events calendar. The rec department puts it out with coordination from the community. Is that something that can be utilized by a public works? I'm looking at Sean, and he's looking at me like I'm with a dagger, I'm sure, that says, here's some significant events in this general area. There's heightened response, There's heightened thought about those areas in that time. Obviously, resources will do what we can, but if, if, if it can't happen, then communication can go back to those event takers for whatever day and say, we may not be able to accommodate your entire request, we may be able to modify, do something so that we can both have the benefits of both communication of the event, the safety and security of the, the patrons, but also understand that public works has a responsibility to not to not blow a budget or blow it in or blow the risk in the in the health and the safety of our own employees. We can't we can't be managing those either. So I'm, it's really more to Sean, I guess. Thank you, Reef and I, I guess I have to respond. Um, I should start by saying we're very fortunate. I, I got a very dedicated crew working with us, and, and I haven't seen too many circumstances where there hasn't been someone available. Um, of course, this whole discussion has very real budget implications and that's something that you know if it sounds like i'm being non-committal just because we are going into the process if we found ourselves in a position where we weren't in violation of regulatory requirement i'm uh, i'm reasonably confident saying the guys would work with us to try to do their best to accommodate i mean a lot of the guys do enjoy it they'll they'll work the overtime if they're legally allowed to work the overtime and if we're into a situation where we haven't been battered by the week that's something we could definitely consider but that being said now you're talking about a situation that has very clear budgetary impact you know if we're calling somebody in two or sorry three o'clock in the morning on a saturday morning that's those are premium hours uh you know so that's something that would have to be very closely monitored, and I would go as far as to say I'm sure that uh, it would be something the council would want to discuss, uh, you know, just to to have that broader discussion about the cost. As far as availability, if the if circumstances dictated and we were able to 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 do it, I've got I've got a lot of confidence in the crew that we have. They're a good bunch. Councilor Vaughn, I'm probably the oldest one here remembers when we had <clears throat> we had angle parking on the east side of Queen Street to comply. And the roadway was quite wide enough. We lost some of that <clears throat> area when we widened the sidewalks. <clears throat> so a drastic measure would be very costly, but it would be a one-time cost. It's taking the bricks out, moving the curb back a few feet, and uh, once we paid that bill, uh, we would be not free of snow problems, but they would be drastically reduced. Councillor Hellingham? I agree. I was just going to say what Brock had said about five requested to narrow the streets. The trucks didn't get any wider, the cars didn't get any wider. They narrowed the streets, requested to narrow the streets. So that's the problem, we know. So I, I really do believe, yes, the snow should be tire and gone for safety somebody's got to pay the piper so they want it done bring in an extra man and do it 
And as Reed Vincent said, <clears throat> it may be have to go to the next council may have to look at area rating. But I agree for safety purposes, get rid of the snow. Higher the hill. Move the motion on this. Yeah, I've I've moved the motion yeah, as yes. it reads today with no no with no adjustments other than the fact that there was a conversation about possible. Yes. You questioned the the bare wording in it. Uh, as is that sufficient, John, or do you feel that you need more in it? I guess I would like, and um, struck in my own mind with this because I mm -hmm. I realize we have a staffing uh, situation, and I also realize we have a budget situation, but I'm also looking at the many, many winters that I've lived in Blythe and looked at the main street and seen situations where the, the banks were not removed and the number of either close calls we've had with traffic or the number of uh, vehicles sitting at one end of the Queen Street waiting for a vehicle to come through the other end so they could then get up through. And I, I applaud the idea that we're going to uh, keep the clear Monday to Friday. Um, but I, I somehow, in my mind, think that we have to do something for the weekends for those significant events that are happening on the main street because uh, a significant event at the Memorial Hall will fill that main street with cars. And uh, mm -hmm. if, if you can't get the street clear, you'll have them parking all over the place. And to me, it's a safety issue. It's not just an inconvenience, it's a safety issue. Okay. But Sean, do you want to comment? Or if on I that? may, Reed Vincent, um, you know, look at the report. Really, the recommendation was only that the report be received. We were, we were volunteering, but uh, suggesting that we were going to implement this effective December fifteenth, because uh, by then we'll have our staffing in place and move forward. Uh, <laughs> I could suggest that aside from that, I can bring something forward uh, in an upcoming uh, council meeting for further discussion. Uh, because anything we do is going to have, you know, those, those budget implications as well as the safety. So, but at okay. the very least, I was suggesting that this would be information. Well, I think we definitely note that there are further concerns and that. And that basically for snowfall and significant events within the village of Blythe, that just that they talk and uh, have township works personnel on alert for when there's things that need to be done. Just one, one comment. I I have to say that I can't support the motion. I don't think it solves the problem at all. Okay. For clarification, the motion yes. is to receive the report. To receive this report. Uh, I, I'm sure the new council will be discussing it. Uh, probably sooner than later. I was going to just also suggest uh, through you to uh, Sean that, as I said, uh, major events at the Memorial Hall are booked well in advance. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think at any time they could submit a list of events that they have coming up on the weekends throughout the winter. Um, and, it, I mean, it may vary, but I don't think very much. So, at this point, I can't tell you how many events that would be, mm -hmm. but I'm sure that... Uh, the uh, 
the theater or 1419 has a list of events that they have planned. So that would give give us a better idea of at least the number of situations that we're looking at. Okay. Well, if there's no further discussion, I'll call the question on receiving the report. All those in favor? Carried. Okay. Uh, moving to 6.4.2, amendments of cross border servicing agreement with Morris Turnberry. Sean's going to start Sean. off and then I'll add. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so May 2017, the uh, cross border servicing agreement between uh, North Huron and Morris Turnberry was, uh, was amended. Uh, the agreement basically outlines the terms surrounding the provision of uh, potable water and wastewater services uh, from North Huron to Morris Turnberry properties. Um, the way it was structured, uh, or is structured, there's a specific list of uh, properties that are serviced with the capacity assignment associated with that, and that list. As uh, new properties are, uh, are introduced, the, uh, the agreement is amended to incorporate those uh, properties to it. Uh, one of the reasons this is before council tonight is um, is to do with the completion of phase one of the William and Area Industrial Land Strategy. Specifically, that was the uh, water main and sewer work that was done uh, uh, on North Street and Arthur Street in Wingham. Um, as a result of the, the completion of that phase, um, Morris Turnberry has approached North Huron with the request to add three properties, uh, specifically 121 North Street, uh, that location is asking for a, an allocation of two cubic meters of water and waste water per day. Uh, 235 Arthur Street uh, is only looking for a single cubic meter of water per day and wastewater service to match. And then 236 Alice Street is a property that is to be subdivided into three parts and they're looking for a total of six cubic meters per day of both water and wastewater. Um, there was uh, much discussion with BM Ross with regard to uh, the capacity that was being requested. There was confirmation that uh, the capacity that was being requested did not exceed our ability to deliver it specifically through the siphon under the, uh, the river. Uh, so that being said, um, those properties uh, would were brought forward and would be uh, the request is to add them to the uh, cross border servicing agreement. Uh, should be meant, should be noted that the uh, financial impact associated with this, um, with regard to capital charges, uh, is set at thirty five hundred dollars per cubic meter. Uh, for sanitary sewer uh, services and $2,500 per cubic meter for water. Uh, this amendment request represents a total capital contribution of approximately $54,000. Now, in addition, and uh, I hope Dwayne can speak to this, there was further amendments to the cross-border servicing agreement <coughs> specifically surrounding the <coughs> schedules uh, F and G. Thanks, John. So in terms of uh, Morris Chamber is also requesting amendments to Schedule F of the Cross-Border Servicing Agreement. And Schedule F of the agreement outlines contributions that Morris Turnberry will make to North Huron for West Cass Community Centre, Blythe Community Centre, cemeteries. Um, so the existing um, West Cass Community Centre, the agreement currently says 70,000. Uh, the proposed Request from Morris Turnberry is 71400 Contribution of Live Community Centre, the current agreement says 16000 Morris Turnberry is proposing 16320 And with respect to cemeteries, it currently says 25000 And the proposed amendment to Schedule F is 17308 and then you'll also notice that uh, Morris Chamber is also indicated in terms of what the proposed contributions would be uh, for those same categories, plus a contingency uh, for 2019, which has been incorporated within the Schedule F as well. Um, in terms of Schedule G, Schedule G is proposed to be a new schedule to the cross-border servicing agreement, and it's to address concerns that have been raised by 
um, as Sean has indicated, there's uh, some new properties um, that are proposed to be added. Um, there have been concerns brought forward in terms of what North, the, that North Huron currently provides services to existing properties as part of the cross-border servicing agreement. And there's a clause in there with respect to, um, in the event that either municipality, either North Huron or Morris Turnberry, you know, wants to change or anything to the agreement. There was a concern expressed that 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 clause that is as written basically gave North Huron the ability to terminate or withdraw services to existing properties that we currently are servicing. To which we indicated that um, there are no plans to terminate or withdraw services <coughs> uh, to existing properties now or in the future. Um, and that, you know, if that cross-border servicing agreement ceases to exist, that we will still continue to provide this services to those properties. Um, so uh, that's not clearly stated um, or as clearly stated in there as they would like it to be. So what we're proposing is to amend Schedule D just to clarify that, clarify that clause that's in the agreement. But, in, but on the flip side, Morris Turnberry has indicated or expressed agreement that um, we can service um, properties up to our capacity. Right, like we we're currently doing a water and wastewater servicing plan, which is going to establish our capacities, and through that those plans, we're going to determine how much additional land we can service as part of the cross water servicing agreement. Uh, once we know how much we're what we can service and what we're currently servicing, you know we can accommodate development in the cross board area up to whatever it is that figure is, but if there's additional properties to be added beyond what we can service. Morris Turnberry has indicated that they will come to the table, for lack of a better word, and assist us and contribute towards those capital improvements and upgrades. So that's the part that's a new Schedule D that is being proposed to be added to the cross border servicing agreement. Is that clear? Uh, as far as you went. Okay. Questions? The, the the one thing that has came up before is would it be as a percentage of new uh, properties being brought on or would it be at the total usage of Morris Turnberry in comparison to a percentage and that at one time Morris Turnberry made the statement that they would be quite happy to pay the percentage of use that they were using of the whole system. Where if, say, that for theoretical, that it was a million dollars for it to expand I'll say siphon capacity under the river for the properties north of the river. Well, would it be, <coughs> say, if it was 25% of our whole system, would we be paying 75% and, they, and them paying 25% of us to add the capacity? Or would it be on an equal basis? If uh, it, it was required. And that is a question that I believe the new council will uh, maybe have to look at because we don't have definition of what they are willing uh, to provide or the, the method of provision. Uh, Councillor Sike? Yeah, no, uh, the, the, the conversation has never. That hasn't been really clarified because really we've always been really concerned about this capacity discussion. And then without this water master study, we, we're, we're always doing this and not really sure if we were close to capacity, at capacity, over capacity, we weren't really know. All we know is that Morris Termery and any of the meetings that I've been a part of has said they're willing to come to the table if it come if it requires the us to re, to increase our system in order to accommodate their prop the properties there as well as the properties they exist. Obviously, if we can't service the properties, 
they're of zero value to them, and they're of zero value to us. So the, the discussion has always been that we are mutually agreeing to this. The industrial land strategy indicates that we were mutually uh, to dealing with this stuff. We got to get back to the table once we get that capacity plan in place that says here it is and what does that look like and get it documented about what is the what is that that you're willing to put on the table like what does that look like for you as Morris Turnberry what does that look like for North Huron and then get it into the agreement so that everybody's um, relatively clear the biggest concern. <laughs> from the Schedule F to the Schedule G was it basically states that if you don't give us Schedule F, we're going to do Schedule G. And that's not, in essence, the intention of that. Re like, the intention was there's the reading in it is that you could you don't do X, Y, and Z, we have the opportunity to disconnect you. And that was their risk, is that they said, you're basically holding us ransom. You don't give us the money you can then come and say, we're not going to service you. And, that, and, and ultimately, I think that's their biggest concern, as well as the property owners that are servicing those locations. So I understand their position, but we need, we as in North Huron, need to be very clear about what our obligation needs to be to the system, what Morris Turnberry's obligation is to the system, because our system is close to capacity in those areas, from what we believe, and ultimately we have significant capital improvements that really need to be happening in the future to our system, and we need to we are servicing Morris Turnberry, so we need to understand what that capital influx is going to be, because that's the intention of that that system. If we can't do it, we can't service them. So I think we need to be on the same page. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Vaughn. I just want some clarification. Uh, <coughs> when Dwayne was talking about uh, they're taking our or going up to our full capacity and if, if they add additional uh, service requirements, uh, shouldn't we keep a, a spare for ourselves or a, a, a primary uh, option in, in case we expand? It just sounds to me as if, as if it was fine if they use up all of the existing capacity. No. No. And I don't know whether I'm or you're the answer the answer the question. I can speak to it. You want to? Sure. As part of this master servicing plan and the capacity assessment, when we get that back, <clears throat> they've, uh, BM Ross is looking at our, our current needs, our future needs, and then the uh, cross-border servicing piece. So uh, when it's brought forward to council, you, you'll have the opportunity to see exactly what we're committing to. And, and I think that's, that's as Councillor Seipert uh, mentioned, I think it's critical that we know what that number is. But yes. all the, in fact, we just discussed it earlier today, and even, even some of the proposed large developments that haven't even begun to start yet, have been included in those calculations so that we're not selling ourselves. Sure. Okay. Uh, Councilor Slate. So the one thing I want to be clear too is that for councilors and public, we, there is two types of capacity here. There's overall system capacity, and then there's the capacity at that north where the trunk sewer is going under the, that. There's two different capacities that we got to be concerned about, not just the, old, the overall capacity. that. The trunk sewer capacity where we're talking around in North Street under the water is the one that affects a lot of the industrial land strategy that we have to be very careful with because that trunk sewer is a big, is in phase, I think, three or four in the industrial land strategy as part of that agreement. So a lot of part of that discussion. So you know, we have to be careful, but when we talk about capacity, what capacity are we talking about? Because it's, it's, it's very critical when you're talking about that. We can give them lots of water. We can only take it so back back so fast. Okay. Any further discussion? 
Do I have a motion? I'll move it if nobody else is going to stick their hand up. Second. Hello again. Deputy Reeve Campbell, second. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion? Carry. Okay. okay, moving to 6.5.1, the Lambton College, the donation of props and training equipment from the ESTC, Marty. Do you have anything that you want to add to that? Um, so they are asking for some request items that's listed in the letter from them. Um, the only thing that, uh, and I, I did have a discussion with the deputy chief tonight, uh, item six, the hydro pool, um, it's felt that our guys could use that. Okay. And it's up to you, but the uh, the fire truck, it's the old uh, Wingham pumper that's been used by the training center for some years. Uh, normally you put that stuff on the uh, gun deals and uh, probably get you know, I don't. I don't know what you get for it, but I wouldn't think you'd get under a thousand dollars for it. So, but I'll leave that one up to you. But uh, number six, the hydro pole prop. Um, it was mentioned that they would like to keep that. The rest of the stuff they really have no use for. Okay. Well, there's some of the air. The scuba, the SCBA, uh, that is any of that the stuff that came from Ontario Fire Academy. I asked the deputy that, and he said no. Okay. He said that, that's all ESTC uh, okay. equipment, but it, it, it's no good to the fire department because it's all expired. Well, I think definitely. This council wanted Fire Department of North Huron to have anything and everything that they were interested in, first and foremost. Am I speaking for council on that? The councilor said. Like, I would, uh, I would, uh, I would think we would like to at least put on Gov D, like, I think the truck has some value there that mm -hmm. that I think it would be important to at least <coughs> venture that look before we just go and hand it off to somebody else. The only the other part that I had was or the only other question I have is there is when you're selling items of self like breathing air apparatuses and stuff like that that are expired, is there is there a concern about liability in the fact that you've now transitioned something that is expired? Like, I, I use the example of if you, something is expired and you sell it to somebody else, are you holding some liability that they're going to use it in some way that um, that is not proper? Like, I just, I, I'm, I'm always concerned about the fact that you hand something to somebody else for a donation or whatever, it's expired, they use it. Or whatever they say they're going to use it for, and they're using it for not what it ha is meant to be, like whether it be training or whatever the case may be. And at the end of the day, something gets happens with it, and our, because it came from us, does that relate us into some in, some liability in the fact that they're utilizing it for not what it's requested or knowing full well that it's expired? I would suggest that when you do. If you do donate the stuff, that something be written out to save that. We would have no liability. No, sir, Cam. Three, Mr. Marty. This fire truck has just been used for training. It's, it's not one of the fleet. For it's not in service. Okay. 
just I just want the clarification on that. Mr. Site. So based on I would I would make the motion that that uh, that we provide the donation for all the items other than the fire truck and the Thank hydro you. pole at this point. And if the fire truck is on gov deals and ends up not getting a significant amount of money or even a, even a thought, then we, we re, then the council, the council elect reconsider providing that donation at, at a later date. Uh, Councillor Stewart seconding. All in favor of the motion? Carried. Okay. And that would be subject to, uh, Signing off. Yeah. Subject to sign off. Okay, and uh, 6.5.2, the fire agreement renewal. And Marty. Thank you, Bree uh, Vincent. Um, so the uh, the fire agreements with Morris Terminating Center here in our are going to expire at the end of this year. Um, it, it's, it lays out, this, this type of uh, calculation lays out a method to determine the fee and um, hopefully it alleviates some, some misconception out there that <coughs> nobody knows where the number came from. Um, so with the assistance of the County 911 uh, Department, we did some calculations of the assessments and I have uh, listed them in the report for your viewing. Uh, these percentages, as it turned out, did come off or close to what was being charged <laughs> currently. So um, you guys were right in the ballpark anyway. Uh, further discussion was held regarding the uh, amount of money that is put away in reserves. Um, it was set at $115,000 annually with the cost of uh, the uh, CPI increase each year. Last year, the amount was $122,040. So it was suggested that they would like to cap that at $100,000 a year. Um, we, could, we could work with that. Um, one of the stipulations that was going to be said in that is if there's a particular item that has to be purchased, uh, then we can go to each council and, and request an extra top up for that. So we know what we're going to purchase in, in the future years. And if, if we're short in that reserve to buy it in that particular year, we would have to go back and, and ask each council for that. Um, I will be doing a uh, an update of the 20 year capital plan. Um, it will be a good exercise for me as well just to learn what is going to be needed in the future and, and what the schedule is. So these figures that I've included in the report are based on the, the 2018 budget. Uh, we did reduce the, we added the cost of living and we did reduce the uh, amount for reserves at hundred thousand dollars and those are the what came out um, the ACW agreement doesn't expire until the end of next year so they have indicated that they would like to stay on the, the old calculations because they still have a year left in their agreement so we have to abide by that and then <coughs> Uh, we're, we're recommending a five-year agreement for Century Huron and Morris Turnberry, and then when ACW joins, it would be a four-year term, and then they would be all even again. So these, uh, this report, uh, we did have a, a couple meetings with the the area CAOs. Uh, Dwayne, myself, and uh, Donna was in, involved in one as well. Um, it was agreed upon it in theory to, to do it this way, 
and each one was going to take it back to their respective councils and uh, see how it, it plays out. And I believe Center here and Morris Trimber are both meeting this week as well, and it's on their agendas. I'll move acceptance you're, of this uh, report. Uh, Councillor Stewart seconding. Any further discussion? All in favor? Carried. Thank you, Marty. And, uh, moving to 6.8.1, Dwayne. Thanks, Reed. So earlier this year, Council received a report from Gallagher, Gallagher McDowell and Associates regarding adoption of a new pay grade for municipal staff. Um, and we've been working through the implementation of that. And through the implementation process, it's been identified that there were three positions uh, currently not on the grid. The positions exist, um, however, they didn't get captured on the grid. And the three positions are the early on facility early on facilitator part-time position, early childhood educator assistant position, and our crossing guards. Um, so we have submitted those job descriptions to the consultant. Consultant has reviewed it, banded it, um, and has put them on the grid. And what you have uh, before you in the bylaw is uh, the new pay grid, which uh, puts these three positions on the grid in the appropriate bands. In terms of budget impact with respect to the approved 2018 budget, um, it includes the placement of the, of the crossing guards on pay one, on band one of the pay grid, so there's no impact. With respect to the early on ed childhood educator position and the early childhood assistant position, we have um, received, well, the early on facilitator position um, is fully funded by the county. Um, and we have received some additional dollars from the county. So through the additional dollars that we've received, uh, we're able to offset the additional costs um, with no impact on the 2018 budget. Motion to approve. To approve, second. Councilor Stewart seconded it. Any discussion on this? All in favor of the motion? Carried. Okay, uh, 6.8.2, Live Hullet Landfill Site Monitoring Agreement. Thanks, so um, follow, following the establishment of the cont contamination attenuation zone surrounding the Live Hullet Landfill Site, uh, the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, as they're now known, issued an amendment to the environmental compliance approval of the site. Um, essentially, the amendment requires Centre here on the North Huron to acquire the groundwater rights in the CAS zone. Um, the CAS zone affects two private uh, property owners, um, and uh, the Blythe Hollett Landfill Board um, has been in discussions uh, with one of the property owners uh, for several months. Um, the negotiations with that particular property owner continue, uh, but we have reached a deal with the second property owner, uh, and that uh, deal or agreement is attached to um, a bylaw that's in your council package 98 to 2018. Essentially, that agreement um, basically secures the groundwater rights of a 9.8 acre privately owned parcel of land. Uh, for um, in a minimum 25 years um, and over the course of the next 25 years there will be ongoing monitoring of various wells and when the monitoring shows that the risk level um, is such that it's nil to non-existent uh, then the board can apply to the ministry to ask for a certificate of withdrawal and on the basis that the ministry issues that certificate uh, we would then um, uh, release the agreement off of title, uh, essentially, which essentially gives the groundwater rights back to the uh, property owner. Um, in the agreement, you'll see that uh, there's a calculation that is done 25%, um, and basically it works out uh, around $8,000. Uh, the recommendation here is that uh, at the end of the uh, time period for which we require the groundwater rights, 
that we um, basically relinquish the groundwater rights uh, at no cost to the property owner. So we're not asking for that uh, money back. Um, the, that, um, the cost for the acquisition of groundwater rights is split 50-50 between Central Huron and North Huron. So it's not 100% borne by us. Motion to approve. Okay. Councilor Biden seconding. Any discussion on this? Go uh, ahead, not really Street. discussion. Just to note that the the address for service uh, for Mr. Housen is is incorrect. It's I think it lists Moreland Street. It's actually West Moreland Street. That's a minor okay. issue. Okay. All in favor of the motion? Carry. Okay, uh, moving <coughs> to 7.1, uh, that there was a letter for information. Um, if council has any questions on the letter, Laura will uh, answer what she can. Uh, or does council have any questions for her at this time? Like uh, just for clarification, so this is a work in progress. It's, yes. It's, there's nothing finalized as yet. It's... That's my understanding. Yep. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Oh. Deputy Reeve Campbell. I've already talked to Laura about this. I think I think we kind of got the bad shake of this deal because we were one of the last municipalities to allow surplus residents Severances. and we are the first one to get caught with this bylaw and so I, we took the bylaw was given to us by the county and i think the county should be hold some of the responsibility for this it shouldn't all just be put on to us as a municipality that we did it all wrong and councillor stewart and again just for clarification any comments that we would receive in connection with this, we will be forwarding on to the county. Um, uh, like comments that yes. are addressed to this council, yes, we will be forwarding to the county so that they we share that information with uh, with Sandra. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, that uh, we do have the one letter so that we would be forwarding it uh, to the county. Okay. Okay, the Reeves Activity Report. Excuse uh, me, Council. Oh, uh, go ahead. Do we need a motion to, uh, to receive this report from the county or not? Um, um, Receive for information. Yeah, we're collecting uh, any comments. That yeah. Have. Okay. If you want to make that motion, receipt for information. I would make that motion. Uh, Councillor Stewart, Deputy Reeve Campbell. All in favor? Carried. Okay. Uh, the Reeves Activity Report. Uh, it's actually been a lighter time for me. Uh, uh, Councillor Seip uh, took care of uh, duties at Silver Stick for me. I'll say thank you. Um, that I attended uh, the Salvation Army uh, Cattle Drive opening. Yeah, that was Friday uh, as well. And that uh, uh, basically it's a number of things that it isn't that I haven't had meetings. They just weren't precipitated by being on council. It was other things. Um, and uh, basically towards the end of the meeting, uh, I will be going through a number of comments, a number of uh, things that uh, looking back over the past 12 years, uh, basically just before adjournment. 
and that other counselors that are uh, not going to be back, uh, that there will be that opportunity for them to bring comments forward okay. at that time as well. Okay, uh, going to counselors that, uh, counselor say. So um, I'll just make mention uh, before uh, I will be talking about 8.2.1, so I'll just uh, make mention of the, uh, the uh, I did uh, provide greetings on behalf of council, as uh, the read mentioned to the Wingham uh, District or Wingham Silverstick uh, this past weekend. Their opening ceremonies. It's their 33rd annual. Uh, the midget one was this past weekend, and the Adam one is, I believe, in next weekend. Um, um, the one uh, excellent thing that I would love to uh, make sure is is known of this council is I did make mention of the. Wingham local PV hockey team that uh, has been uh, going um, and preparing for the Good Deeds Cup that is uh, prov provided by Chevrolet uh, to all uh, PV hockey teams in in Canada. Um, uh, the Wingham PV group decided to do their Good Deeds Cup uh, fundraising and uh, Good Deed on Juvenile Diabetes Foundation. They have a, a an individual on their team that has been di recently diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And they had an event that uh, I brought to this council that we mentioned. Um, I did want to follow up with that to, to mention that they, they uh, provided a number of what they earned um, for the uh, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. And that number was $15,110 approximately roughly around that number that is what they have provided the check for for juvenile diabetes foundation um and you know good for them um it was very humbling to hear the fact that when they started on this journey their hope and pray was they would make twenty five hundred dollars so to say that they've made six and a half times that um i think goes goes really to the character of the team, the parents, the the community. The community has really got behind these children. And uh, I can honestly say that I'm very happy that I could be a part of it just through donations and being able to be a part of that uh, um, that event because you know that was a it's an excellent idea of what children can do when they put their minds to something and they really feel that there's a connection with a cause. Um, you know, I, the family is very, uh, it's very new to them. It's very new to them. Uh, and it, it, it's raw. So, you know, it's to see that emotion, to see the caring of the kids that want to help, uh, and to hear the juvenile diabetes foundation that night, uh, you know, provide some to say that they did, uh, you know, they saved a kid's life. Um, you know, it was very humbling to hear because, uh, it's something that uh, those kids will never forget. Um, it's something that family will never forget. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's the type of things that we need to be uh, cognizant of in our area and our community because, you know, those are the things that we need to be very passionate about. And uh, I think those kids, uh, I know we'll be getting a letter from this council, uh, hopefully uh, sooner rather than later. But I, but I definitely did want to congratulate them uh, for a job well done. And it, and it hasn't stopped. They're going to continue to provide funds to whatever group causes that they have. And hopefully uh, at the end of this, um, they can be celebrating a Good Deeds Cup for, for North Huron and for the Wingham PB and the Wingham Minor Hockey. So, um, I did want to mention that. You're moving the motion for the letter... So I think that we already had a motion. I think I believe I already had a motion, but if there isn't a motion, on, I will move another one because I couldn't recall if we actually, uh, if I didn't make that motion, but I, I would ask uh, that a letter be sent to the, the PV hockey team on behalf of this council, congratulating them for their job well done and their successes in their current season. Second. Councilor Ritzman, can we get second? Any other comments from council? All in favor? Carried. 
So, oh, okay. so I will. Uh, I'll talk to eight point two point one, which is the transfer from reserves for police legal fees. So, the board. This was a discussion a couple of weeks ago or a month ago about some legal fees that the police services has incurred due to uh, costs associated to investigations by um, the, as being a part of the uh, police service. So. Uh, everybody is aware of the incident in Blue Vale with uh, one of our officers on, on, a, on a, an arrest. The other one is the uh, incident that happens in, in White Church with that particular incident. Um, all of those, as part of our agreement with the Police Service uh, Association, we if, if they need legal fees with regards to the an investigation, if they would like the legal counsel on their side uh, as they're through their discussions with their investigation, the police service is willing to support them in that in that regard. In that regard, obviously, we can't budget knowing what incidents are going to happen. So, you know, from now until uh, the motion that's on the table is that the police services board had requested that council um, authorize transfer of the necessary funds from the police re legal reserve fund to cover legal expenses not included in the 2018 budget. Obviously, the reason we've made that as as ended as way it is, is because we don't know if there's going to be another thing happen between now and December 31st. So obviously, the intention is if it's not covered in the 2018 budget, it will come out of reserves. Um, the police services board indicates about five thousand dollars a year gets put into reserve. So you know there is reserve capacity there to 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 eat these uh, these extra costs. So I think it's around I think it's around ten thousand dollars if I recall the number um, in 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 that sense of what's going to be coming out. But that's the intention of this motion uh, is because the police services board is actually the owner of the budget, but municipality actually holds the money. So we, th that's the reason for this motion to council today. You're moving. I am. Uh, Deputy Reeve Campbell seconds. Is there any discussion on this? All in favor of the motion. Gary. Excuse me. Uh, I wanted to say something on 8.2, but are, are, are you giving your, your talk before we break for the closed session? Uh, the closed session is expected to be very short. It's just a quick update. Uh, so that um, uh, it will be after the closed session, uh, just before the confirmatory bylaw. There won't be anybody here then. Is it okay if I read my piece now? Um, the confirmatory or the set the in camera session should be under three minutes if the people can't wait that long. Um, uh, we're going into the longest part of the meeting possibly. Uh, these bylaws have all been talked about before, <coughs> but there is a big list tonight. So we'll start off with uh, bylaw 95, 2018. Being a bylaw to designate locations in the township of North Heron as a community improvement project area be introduced for the first, second, third, and final time signed by the Reeve and clerk and being grossed in the bylaw book. Councilor Richmond Finga, Deputy Reeve Campbell, all in favor? Gary. Bylaw number 96, 2018. Being a bylaw to adopt a community improvement plan for the town for the North Huron Community Improvement Project area be introduced, read a first, second, third, and final time, signed by the Reed and Clerk, and be engrossed in the bylaw book. Uh, Councillor Site, Councillor Vaden, all in favor? Gary. Bylaw number 97, 2018. 
uh, being a bylaw to authorize the read and clerk to sign on behalf of council a municipal funding agreement between the Corporation of the Township of North Huron and the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, AMO, for Municipal Main Street Revitalization Initiatives be introduced, read a first, second, third, and final time, signed by the reader clerk and engrossed in the bylaw book. Councillor Stewart, uh, Councillor Ritzma Tenenga, all in favor? Carry. Bylaw number 98, 2018. Being a bylaw to authorize the read and clerk to sign on behalf of council an agreement between William Fed Frederick Housen and the Corporation of the Municipality of Central Huron and the Corporation of the Township of North Huron for groundwater rights for the Blythe Hullet <coughs> landfill. He read a first, second, third, and final time. Signed by the read and clerk and be engrossed in the bylaw book. Councillor Hallahan, Councillor Vladen, all in favor? Gary. Bylaw number 99, 2018. Being a bylaw to amend the cross border servicing agreement between the Corporation of the Township of North Huron and the Corporation of the Municipality of Morris Turnberry. He read a first, second, third, and final time. Signed by the reading clerk and being engrossed in the bylaw book. Councillor Hallahan, Councillor Sight, all in favor? Gary. Okay, uh, bylaw number 100, 2018. Being a bylaw to authorize the reading clerk to sign on behalf of Council a subdivision agreement between GJAJ Holdings Limited, a developer. And the Corporation of the Township of North Huron, the municipality. He read a first, second, third, and final time, signed by the Reeve and Clerk, and be engrossed in the bylaw book. Deputy Reeve Campbell, Councillor Stewart, all in favor? Carried. Bylaw number 101, 2018. Be it a bylaw to amend bylaw 48, 2018. Being a bylaw to establish salary ranges for municipal employees of the Corporation of the Township of North Huron, be read a first, second, third, and final time, signed by the reading clerk and be engrossed in the bylaw book. Councillor Vladen, Councillor Ritzman Deninga, all in favor? Carried. Uh, bylaw number 102, 2018. Being a bylaw to name certain highways in the Township of North Huron. Be introduced, read a first, second, third, and final time, signed by the reading clerk, and be engrossed in the bylaw book. Councillor Seip, Councillor Ritzman Deninga, all in favor? Carried. Bylaw number 103, 2018. Being a bylaw to authorize the reading clerk to sign on behalf of council an Agreement of purchase and sale between Tucker Smith Communications Cooperative Limited, the purchaser, and the Corporation of the Township of North Huron, the vendor, for the property described as Part 1 RP 22R 6707, part of Lot 22, Concession 14, Geographic Township of Hullet, Municipality of Central Huron, be introduced, read a first, second, third, and final time. Signed by the Reeve and Clerk and be engrossed in the bylaw book. Deputy Reeve Campbell, Councillor Stewart, all in favor? Carried. Bylaw number 104, 2018. Being a bylaw to amend bylaw 18, 2016, being a bylaw to govern the calling, place, and proceedings of the Council and committees of the Township of North Huron and to provide public notice of meetings. Be introduced, read a first, second, third, and final time, signed by the Raven Clerk, and be engrossed in the bylaw book. Councillor Hallahan, Deputy Reed Campbell. All in favor? Carried. Okay, uh, Councillor Vaughan, rather than have it after, if you want to go ahead and read uh, yours now, go ahead. I'd like to. Okay. I'd like to thank uh, the people of Blythe for their support for me during the past nine years. I acknowledge the extraordinary efforts from the Blythe community members and organizations such as the Sparling family, 
Cowbell Breweries, the 1419 Committee, the Blythe BIA, Blythe Festival for the Arts, Blythe Legion, and the Wingham Legion, as well as other members of the community that have contributed so much to the, uh, to the municipality. Of particular note is the 1419 Committee's management and promotion of the Blythe Memorial Community Hall. The recent R2R conference has raised the visibility and respect towards Blythe and North Huron, and to the cause of rural municipalities everywhere. I hope that Blythe people will continue to support their new representatives, Kevin Faulkner and Rick McBurney. Also notable is the great community effort by the Town Hall Theatre Committee in Wingham, which came up with an ambitious project to upgrade this facility. They developed the plan, raised the required funds, guided the implementation through the completion, for the benefit of the Wingham community and thereby the whole municipality. The spirit of cooperation and leadership exhibited by this council, I think has been outstanding in these past years. In terms of representing the whole municipality and not just individual wards, it's been a pleasure to work with the outgoing uh, members, Deputy <coughs> Vincent, Deputy Reed Campbell, and Councillors Hallahan, Stewart, and Ritzman Tominga, and Councillor Seep. Councillor Seep is going to uh, serve as a key role in the next council while <coughs> the new members are learning their ro roles. We must give a special vote of thanks to Reeve Neil Vincent for his many years of municipal service, using his vast knowledge of municipal policies, procedures, and issues. His contributions to the North Huron Council and Huron County Council will be missed in the new term and going forward. I wish him well in whatever endeavors he undertakes in the future. <clears throat> this council has been well served by the municipal staff who have always exhibited great competence, knowledge, and dedication. Our CAO, Dwayne Evans, has done an exemplary job of supporting council and leading the senior management team. I know that he will continue as an effective support to the new council. And I'm sure that we all wish the incoming council great success as well as that of all of North Huron. Thank you. Thank you. Jim or Ray, do you want to speak now? I just want to thank uh, the repairs that's put me here in this chair. It's been a, a uh, an honor to serve them. Ten years, I guess, I've spent all together. Um, there's a lot of exciting things going on in North here. Thank the staff, fellow councillors, Vincent, and all the best to the new council. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. James? Well, I, I've been here for a long time, you know. It's <laughs> kind of hard to give up this seat, but I'm looking forward to it. I'm not sure my wife is because it's home more often. But it has been a pleasure to serve the ward of East Walnut and to work with the other two wards. It's been, I've really enjoyed the Inland Council. It's 24, 25 years in there somewhere. I'm not really sure. It actually went on as uh, I contacted Donnie Schultz to see if he would run for Reeve. And Donnie says, I'll run for Reeve if you run for council. Very first year I was acclaimed. And Ronnie or Donnie had to run for an election. I think all of East Walnuts was acclaimed that very first year. It's been a real pleasure. There's been a get to know a lot of staff. Uh, we were standing in the Godrich Parade the other night, and there was a young lady and her family standing beside us. And she used to work at the complex. I'm like, this is something that, you know, we get to recognize some of these people around us. And, I certainly wish all the new, new councillors coming on, and Trevor, and, and Bernie is going to take this top position up here. It's not a bad job, but there's times it's not a good job either. Uh, you know, when you get that phone call at, at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning to say, where is our snowplow? It's just an example. I don't have to get up to that call anymore. Some of those numbers I, I memorized <laughs> because you knew who was going to call. But 
putting all that behind, it's it's been a real pleasure to work, especially with the staff. Uh, there's been new staff. There's some that's been here for a while. <laughs> Sorry, Doc. <laughs> Barb here. Barb was in East Walnosh when I started there. But uh, all the best. And uh, put your best foot forth and enjoy it. Don't don't look at the bad days, because there will be some. But it's only been a couple nights I had trouble sleeping after I went home. But other than that, it, it is a good job. And I want to thank Neil for giving us leadership. For all the rest of us gathered around this table, we spent a lot of hours here. And uh, thank you very much for your support. <coughs> Do you want to go next? Sure. Um, it's been a pleasure serving for the last four years. I've really enjoyed it and I have learned a lot and um, wish all the new councils, councilors coming in and Bernie on the best as they take on this very important leadership role and as we continue to move forward as North Huron and to uh, continue to really make it a, a great place to do business and to live. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm glad Council had their uh, comments relatively organized. Mine are basically random from the past 12 years. And what I'm starting out with, it was a pleasure to be part of the group that organized the Fire Department of North Huron. Having that first chief, John Black, such a galvanizing force that brought two distinctly different fire departments together. And he did it with grace, with knowledge, with respect for every one of his firefighters. I know there's others in the room that can echo that comment. Uh, a tremendous man that we lost way too soon. Uh, we built the ESTC uh, with federal assistance because at that time we couldn't get any provincial money towards a fire hall, which we needed probably worse than Clinton did <coughs> at the time. Uh, there's many road and street upgrades uh, we've done. Uh, we've worked on our buildings, upgrading as codes became more detailed. Uh, we worked a very successful two-year rebuild on Wingham's Main Street by working closely with the County of Huron. And all five county roads uh, for North Huron have had rebuilds in the last 15 years. Um, uh, we worked our way through source water protection, uh, which was a very long drawn out procedure. And the Ontario Safe Drinking Water Protocols, which I know council uh, questioned having to sign on personal liability uh, above what municipal liability was. And upgrade uh, the, the sewer system under the river to the south of town uh, so that uh, we were getting everything to the treatment plant, not polluting the river. We finished the work on the complex, such as concrete ceiling and a number of other things, uh, such as the safety glass uh, on uh, the, the railings that uh, had a drop in front of them, and things like that. Uh, also, we think we have the pool liner uh, problem finally solved last year uh, by that the pool liner that came from Italy 
wasn't right, right from the start, but we think we've got that mastered now. And uh, the pool is a great attraction for North Huron, even though it is a costly thing for us to have as a service uh, for the size of our population. The condensation problem at the pool roof, uh, we think we have much of that figured out now, and it's dealing with temperatures to prevent condensation uh, between differing uh, uh, pieces of the roof uh, infrastructure. Uh, we definitely hope that's uh, pretty well taken care of. Well, we lost three public schools. One of them is home to European appliances. One is being developed as the Canadian Centre for Rural Creativity. And one that Council had the most involvement with is now part of the Wingham Healthcare Campus. We were also part of the Wingham District the Hospital upgrade and the very functional expansion of the cancer care services uh, on tour that I had uh, a bit over a month ago. That was a really great opportunity to see the level of professionalism and the amount of I'll say separation uh, that they have in preparing the chemo drugs, uh, the gowning up, the masking, and all that there's five independent uh, monitors that the amount and the dosage and the person's name is all checked out a minimum of five times in that process. So it ranks with any hospital providing chemo care in the province for the, the setup of and administering of those chemo drugs. Uh, after many years of filing grant applications, we just went ahead and tackled the Mill Street sewer, storm sewer project in Blythe. It's far from being done, but we got from the creek to Westmoreland and across Westmoreland, and we got Westmoreland rebuilt. Uh, it's a pleasure driving on Westmoreland now. Uh, Mill Street, not so much, but uh, that's uh, something uh, that's still in the future. Uh, as hard as we try, there's still things for the new council to do. Uh, also in Blythe, we have a new well uh, just north of the Blythe Community Center. With the uh, expansions and more services required uh, by many properties, serviced by both sewer and water in both Wingham and Blythe that uh, it's, it's always been a pleasure to see new builds come online and uh, be opened. The Blythe Memorial Hall has been completely rebuilt. We're the editor and his reporter in the Citizen uh, newspaper, uh, I felt did not reflect the amount of council work that went into that project. North Huron Council owned that building right until the management was turned over to 1419. We were in charge of every bit of the rebuild. We did it in consultation and 1419 had two people that worked diligently on fundraising for it. 
but none of that fundraising would have worked had it not been for the 500,000 that this council had the nerve to do in the first place in talking to the former deputy premier it was a small municipality like this put that biggest step forward that got the provincial money coming it was also with the townships money and the provincial money that we got the federal money and without North Huron taking the first step uh, in it, there wouldn't have been any county money either. Also, I say thank you to Sharon Chambers for all the work that she did with me in the meetings that we had with 1419 establishing uh, a protocol to work with, to work with 1419. Basically, many of the things were taken from the agreement that the Belgrave Community Center has with North Huron. And that was sort of a pattern uh, for the public-private uh, partnership that uh, it's uh, an amazing project and Pat Newsom, Denise, and a number of the others in staff. I'm positive that they put way more hours into that Memorial Hall project than they ever claimed on their uh, timesheets. No, that was a very big thing for North Huron to have done, and that if it hadn't have been for the ones that were here, it wouldn't have happened. So I say thank you to all involved with that. Um, and we worked diligently with other planning groups always working for what is best for the whole community. Um, okay. I didn't have much to do for a while this afternoon, so I was just jotting down phrases. And that yes, we did not do the lobbying for a lot of that money, but the first step so that uh, it was something that no matter what anybody says, I know the meetings that I was involved with and sharing chambers served us very well in the meetings that the two of us were at in working on that. Uh, as with all modern businesses, staff change is inevitable. And we at North Huron have maybe had more than our share. But when we hire good people, we have to be prepared to lose some of them. I know of headhunter firms that specifically watch what North Huron are doing. And they have got some of the good people. So we have had to replace them. So we get the best we can get. And the one thing that new, the new council will have to work on is possibly we may have to train more of our staff from a basic level into mid-level and above that. Because especially in truck drivers, we have had to train a number of the firemen 
to have the licenses to drive the trucks. It isn't like it was when I was growing up, you got a D or an A license automatically if you're on a farm, because you might have to drive a truck. Uh, where very, it, it just isn't the norm in, I'll say, teenagers and ones in their early 20s now. But as with everything, uh, the training is something that is never lost. Training is one of the easiest things for a person to carry. Training and education are the easiest skills to carry. And times are changing and the council is changing, but continue to cherish the opportunity that I have had and we as councils have had to network and make friends and especially, and you will find this at conventions, we all want to make our homes a better place to live. And that's the essence of serving on a municipal council is you want your community to be a better place in the future and you do everything in your power to make that happen. So thank you to all the staff, past staff, and the counselors, because no matter what group you have, you'll be surprised at what other skill you didn't realize somebody in the room had. It is one of the best and fastest learning experiences that you will ever have. So cherish it and look forward to it. Thank you for the opportunity that I've been given. Okay. Uh, motion to be in camera. Councillor Slate, Councillor Hallahan, all in favor? Very short recess.